Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. good morning. I invite you to please stand and adopt an appropriate posture for prayer. And I'd like to call Mrs. Lyra Thomas Joseph as she prays to commence our session this morning. Jesus give us guidance, give us wisdom and understanding. And at the end of the day, let our day to be productive and successful. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Cooperatives and Consumer Affairs, Honorable Emma Hippolyte. Our moderator for today, Dr. Adrian Auger, Economic Development Consultant. Our panelists, we have um, Executive Director of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture, Mr. Brian Luisi, Mr. Jason King, Treasurer of the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, Dr. Tecla Fitz-Lewis, President of the National Consumers Association, Mr. Joseph Cox, Assistant Secretary General, CARICOM, joining us virtually, representatives of the various business associations and organizations, management and staff of the Ministry of Commerce and the Department of Finance, in-house and virtual audience, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today as we have this very important discussion on inflation. Today, we will have a candid discussion as the members of our panel, they were not paid, so they will be very frank. And at the end of the day, we are hoping that after all is said and done, we can do our review. A lot has been done to um, deal with that elephant in the room called inflation. Um, but we still like to include the members of the public. We would like to hear from you so that anything that we have not considered, we would like to um, consider your feedback so that we can continue to deal with that elephant in the room called inflation. At this time, I would like to invite our honorable minister, Minister Emma Hippolyte from the Ministry of Commerce, as she delivers the opening and welcome remarks. Minister. Ministry of Finance and Commerce, Dr. Adrian Auger, distinguished who's our moderator for this session today, distinguished members of our panel, Ambassador Joseph Cox of CARICOM, Dr. Sector Luis of the National Consumers Association, Mr. Brian Luisi, Director of the Chem St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Jason King, Treasurer of the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, um, staff of the Ministry of Commerce, I see the President of the Fashion Council, technical other staff of the Ministry of Finance, other members of our in-house audience, members of the media, those of you joining us via the live stream, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, friends and well-wishers, particularly in this festive season, I want to wish you a warm and pleasant good morning to all of you. And we are here from this lovely Hotel Belgeau near the summit of the La Pancé Hill in Castries, St. Lucia. And today, 
We have taken some time out to come together to discuss a very topical and somewhat controversial subject, which has been on the lips of all citizens, not only of St. Lucia, not only of the OECS, not only of CARICOM, but of the world. In one way or another, over the past two years, between 2022 and 2023, um, we all have been having one conversation or another concerning different things, high prices, cost of living. We have our own terminology. But the subject in question is experienced by many of high and rising prices of goods and services across all sectors of our domestic economy, but more so in food, retail, and the distribution sector. This sentiment regarding a marked and sustained increase in prices has been so widespread and broad-based that it has culminated in the crescendo of voices, even resulting in a petition, crying out in anguish and despair for some kind of intervention and relief from businesses and, of course, our government. In brief, the observed phenomenon of a great increase in the price of goods and services over a given period of time is what the economists call inflation. It is measured by percentage changes in the consumer price index, which captures movements in prices of items in our consumption basket. This basket is made up of various goods and services or sub-indices on which we typically spend our money, albeit in different proportions or weights on a monthly basis. And these sub-indices include one, food and beverages, two, shelter or housing, three, clothing, four, transportation, five, health, six, recreation or entertainment, seven, education, and eight, communications. Although some of these indices have moved more than others, they have all generally increased. As a result, we have been told by our statistics office there ha that there has been some 6.3% increase in the average cost of this consumer basket. But where did this episode of inflation um, come from? Most of you have been asking, and some of you have been speculating. While there are many causes of inflation, such as increases in price of inputs or the money supply, the recent spike in inflation, which the world has been experiencing over the period 2022, 2021, 2023, sorry, has been largely attributed to the post-COVID era. As we recovered from COVID, you have as well um, disrupted global supply chains where we have been unable to respond or match the surge in global demands across many commodities, including oil and food, compounded by shipping delays and other logistics-related bottlenecks as economies reopen. This supply shortfall and imbalance in global markets serve to drive prices upward, resulting in a peak in global inflation in 2022, which ranged between 7.2 to 9.8%. In advanced economies such as the US, the Euro area, and emerging markets, the highest in decades. And in the US, uh, up to last night on the news, it was saying it's the highest in 40, 40 years. In St. Lucia's case, inflation likewise climbed to an unprecedented high, causing much anxiety and consternation among the population. But why should we care about inflation? What are some of the impacts of inflation? We, including the government, 
are concerned about inflation, and rightfully so, because it has a deliter deliterous and negative impact on individuals and households in a number of ways. For example, it slows down economic growth. It reduces our purchasing power and increases the cost of living. Left unchecked, inflation also reduces the real value of our savings and makes creditors worse off as the real value of debt payments reduces as inflation rises. For these and other reasons, inflation is in many ways against the grain of good macroeconomic management. Hence, central banks and governments around the world do all that is possible to take corrective action to contain inflationary impulses in an attempt to restore price stability, which is critical to the attainment of prosperity and economic growth. So today, why are we here? We felt it was important to have public outreach and consultation. And that is to help us make sense and better understand all of this and what we have all been experiencing in this country and the world over with respect to this problem. In terms of what it is, what caused it, its effect, and what we can expect going forward. The Ministry of Commerce has partnered with the Ministry of Finance to present to you this public consultation on this very pertinent subject of inflation. Given the esoteric nature of the subject matter, we have brought together a mix of technical expertise from within and outside the public service, and we have gone as far as CARICOM, which is going to bring us, with, uh, give us a regional perspective to engage us on the subject. In so doing, we begin with two presentations, which I am confident will dissect, dissect the anatomy of inflation in its local, regional, and international dimension so that we can all get a better and more informed appreciation of this macroeconomic situation. The information to be presented to us in the presentations will provide an analytical context and point of departure, which our esteemed panelists can use as a launch pad to further elaborate on the issues raised under the able guidance of our distinguished moderator, Dr. Roger. This initiative, in which we have sought to reach out to engage the consuming public in a constructive dialogue on the subject of utmost importance, is part of my ministry and my government's approach to policy formulation, based on a more participatory and interactive relationship with our principal clients, namely yourself as consumers, as well the business community and the general public. Although, as I'm told, rates of inflation have shown signs of trending downwards across the world in a, in a number of major markets, as well as in St. Lucia, prices regrettably remain relatively high and above pre-pandemic levels. This is concerning given that wage and salaries have not kept pace with such price increases, resulting in an erosion of purchasing power, real incomes, and the net worth of individuals. So notwithstanding, I think that today's exercise is time well spent as there are lessons to be learned going forward from the information which will be shared with you, our audience, as we seek to help elucidate and demystify the subject of inflation. Meanwhile, the government will remain vigilant and continue to monitor this situation. We stand ready to further met to take further measures in the incoming fiscal year. 
as may be necessary to supplement the policy actions which have already been implemented to help mitigate the effects of the inflation-induced price shocks, especially on the move on the more vulnerable members of our society. And I can maybe remind you here of some of the things that our government has done to assist you, the consumer. Only on Tuesday, we went into Parliament to, first we had the passing of the consumer, um, consumer bill, consumer protection bill. Then Tuesday gone, we went in to amend that bill to provide um, authority for our ministry and our staff to obtain information from the business community. Um, as a government, we have removed the 6% service charge on all price control goods. As a government, we continue to provide subvention on rice, flour, sugar, and cooking gas. Um, recently, our government removed VAT on building material as well as sanitary products. We have the placement, we have placed sanitary products on the price control. On the government side, we have provided um, relief in tax arrears and, and fines so that our businesses themselves could maneuver through this difficult period. So you have a government that is very conscious of what is happening to our consumers, and we actively try to see how we can bring some soulagement to the people of St. Lucia. So finally, while our policies responding to deal with inflation have predominantly been from the perspective of protecting or advancing consumer welfare, we also equally, we are also equally concerned about our business community. As producers, and providers of goods and services. With that in mind, we intend to work with our retailers, distributors, and manufacturers to strengthen the regulatory environment for the conduct of business in St. Lucia, so as to ensure the prevalence of ethical and fair trading practices, which will help to curb and suppress excessive price increases, and by extension, inflationary pressures in the economy. With no further ado, I would like to extend season greetings to all of you and wish you a very productive and unfettered discourse on the subject before us. As we seek to hear from you and our panelists on this very important subject of inflation. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you and may God guide our discussion. Also summarize the measures that have been implemented thus far to give some relief. We now have two presentations. One will be one of the presentations by Ms. Gemma Lafay. Gemma is the director of the Research and Policy Unit in the Department of Finance. And the second presentation will be done by Dr. Thomas Samuel. And Dr. Samuel is the trade advisor in the Ministry of Commerce. And this is to provide you with the facts and additional information so that persons will be well informed. And this will also set the tone for our panel discussion. So I'd like to invite Gemma Lafay, followed by Dr. Samuel.
everyone. Um, Honorable Minister Hippolyte, uh, distinguished panelists, um, representatives of the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Commerce, representatives from the business community, the online audience, and the public in general. Um, following through from the comments and the remarks by Minister Hippolyte, um, we would like to delve a bit deeper into um, dissecting the, what is a macroeconomic um, problem called inflation um, by taking a look at the pretty much what is inflation, what are the causes generally of inflation, why is it a problem, and then we will basically move into looking at the inflationary trends globally, then regionally, and also domestically within St. Lucia's economy, and um, we will briefly glance through the, the various measures that have been taken by the government of St. Lucia in mitigating the effects of inflation, and then we will end by basically presenting you with a, a brief outlook of inflation for the rest of um, this year and into 2024. Um, so as the Minister Hippolyte has articulated quite well, um, inflation, as we most of us know, is the a general rise in the prices of goods and services in the domestic economy over time. And it has many causes. It is both driven by external factors as well as domestic factors. Um, generally, we have factors that affect demand for, for goods and services and also factors that affect um, supply in a sense that the cost and availability of Producing some items, goods and services, are affected by a number of cost factors that affect various inputs into the production of goods and services, such as raw materials, inputs such as electricity and transport, as well as labor costs. The minister would have touched on the wage, wage issue regarding um, the nexus between wages and inflation. And so, to the extent that inflation really reflects uh, an imbalance between supply and demand um, in any, at any given point in time, um, it really reflects the, the, the more dominant factor, whether it's supply or demand, that's actually driven us to a particular point to experience high inflation. Um, so inflation, quite apart from inflation being an increase in the prices of goods and services, it really becomes a macroeconomic issue when inflation rises above a certain level. So generally, countries expect and encourage or desire to achieve moderate levels of inflation in a given year. However, when inflation passes surpasses that average or that limit, um, it begins to be problematic. When persons actually feel the pinch and in their pockets and they put it in power, and it becomes more broad-based to a wider range of goods and services. It also creates quite a bit of uncertainty and affects the way consumers, businesses, investors behave, um, which then basically presents a problem for the economy going forward as business confidence and consumer confidence um, could be affected, which would then impact the uh, business or consumer's ability to spend and to basically encourage activity in the economy. In terms of how it is measured, um, the Central Statistics Office, which is commonly known as the Statistics Department, um, usually uses uh, an index, what we call the Consumer Price Index, which is based on a household survey that is taken at a given point in time to reflect the average consumption of goods and services, a set basket of goods and services um, by the average household. Um, these items are tracked on a monthly basis by the, the, the department and reported on a monthly basis. The basket includes a wide range of goods and services. While most persons who would tend to think of inflation as only being the cost of goods, particularly what is spelled at the supermarket, is a lot broader concept than that in the sense that it affects the cost of insurance, travel, communications, recreation, other services, and other goods, um, not commonly um, uh, well, not commonly complained about in the, in the general public. In terms of what has happened globally and what took us to where we are now, um, we will see that, for instance, in the week or during the pandemic, um, country that um, the countries that have actually, our the advanced countries of the world, the major economies in the world, would have undertaken aggressive monetary policies to help calm down inflation and to basically bring some relief um, to the consumers and the citizenry. Um, so just to provide you here with a pictorial impression of what has happened and transpired since COVID, um, we would see here from the graph on the left that inflation um, globally has, es was es has escalated in 2022 from just about 4.7% in 2021 um, to about 8.7%. That represented a multi-decade increase that's the highest inflation rate um, since the last 40 years. 
And um, in 2023, given having experienced a high and elevated level of inflation, um, as I said before, um, advanced economies, particularly central banks in those countries, could have taken many interventions to help bring down inflation and to basically achieve the, the macroeconomic goals um, for the economies. So as a result of those actions, we'd have seen a decline in the rate of inflation um, from 8.7% to 6.9%. I would just like to reiterate here that while we see inflation is declining globally, it does not mean that it, the prices are falling. It means that the prices are rising at a slower rate um, than we experienced in 2022. Um, so the, then the question becomes, what led to that escalation in prices in 2022? Um, of course, in the wake of COVID, when there were lockdowns across the world, when economies reopened thereafter, um, when the vaccine was distributed and implemented across many countries, we see that um, the governments would have opened up, would have created a strong demand, which exceeded the availability of the supply of goods across the world. Um, also too, in trying to in providing some relief to um, persons during the COVID pandemic, governments around the world have embarked on significant um, fiscal stimulus um, to provide um, relief to the, the, the citizenry. And also at the same time from February, March of 2022, we saw that this situation was exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine war. And then with that came higher oil prices and additional increases in food prices. In terms of looking closer at what were the specific factors that led to um, the increase that we saw from the middle of 2021 and throughout 2022, we see for sure that the lingering effects of the COVID pandemic would have contributed significantly to the escalation in prices across the world. So we have recall that there were clogged ports across the world. Containers were, were, were stuck in some parts of the world like China. Um, as a result of that, there were other backlogs um, that countries were awaiting the, the, the orders that were actually um, put in before. Also, there were input bottlenecks, and there were also labor shortages as persons who have been affected by COVID. And also, um, in having experienced COVID, um, some persons did, did not return to the workforce. Um, so these COVID-related issues created what we call the supply chain bottlenecks that we'd have experienced um, in, the, in, in that period. We also saw um, with that, there was a heightened increase in the price of shipping um, to move containers across the world. And that would have contributed to the increase in the imported price of a lot of products across the world. And um, the freight cost is also linked to the escalation in oil prices and commodity prices, which would have been made worse by the Russia war in the, in the first quarter of 2022. And um, quite apart from that, there were also some sectoral shifts in demand where Most of these pressures, inflationary pressures or factors, would have eased somewhat in 2023. And some of that being um, the unwinding of fiscal stimulus um, by the governments, they had, they had expired and come to an end. And also, too, that was coupled with the fact that the governments were also introducing interest rate increases to help cool down demand and hence suppress consumer spending. Um, just to show you here that um, the Contribution, of course, to inflation in 2021-22 was um, towards the end of this quarter um, in 2023. Oil prices, you will recall, um, would have got, gone up from $68 a barrel in 2021 to about $95 a barrel in 2022. And um, in 2023, it has declined by just about 17% to just about $80 a barrel. Yeah, just to show you here, of course, the, what has happened is
is demand. Um, we see that uh, production in the non-OPEC countries would have increased substantially, particularly from the US, and of course, some, some small contributions from Guyana um, in the region. Um, and um, again, in 2022 especially, and so, so the first quarter of 2023, we had the efforts by the OPEC countries, largely Saudi Arabia and Russia, to help prop up, keep prices of oil high. But these um, forces or that factor was counter, counterbalanced by the, the efforts by the, of the non-OPEC countries um, to increase production and put a downward pressure on prices. Again, just to indicate here that the, one of the major, further apart from having the decline in commodity prices, many food and oil prices, another major contributor to the decline that we saw in, in inflation in 2023 was the continued tightening of, of monetary policy by the central banks around the world. So we see here on the graph that there was a steady increase in the policy interest rates by the central banks in the US, um, in Europe, Canada, and um, other major advanced economies. In the US specifically, which is our major trading partner, um, we see that rates increases were 11 times during the course of, from March of 2022 to July of 2023. Um, moving from essentially 0% interest rate at, in March of 2022 to just about 5.25% in July. And it has remained uh, at that rate since July as a result of the decision by the Federal Reserve to pause in the interest rate hikes. Given that they are satisfied with the movements in inflation in the US, um, given that downward trend that, that has been reported. Uh, in the US, we saw that inflation would have actually declined from 8.1%, a peak of 8.1% in 2022, to just about an average of a 3.5% um, in 2023. And we see a similar pattern for the UK as well, although inflation has been a lot more stubborn in the UK than in the US, given that this, the UK and Europe is a lot more exposed to the effects of the war that is closer to them than the US. And also, we see in the other major economies like China, um, not much differences in inflation given their own economic situation there. And um, Canada, similar pattern. Uh, in terms of how those external environment, um, economic environment has affected the regional economy, um, we see that similar pattern um, reflected in our regional performance. Whereas, given that we are uh, open economies, all of us in Lucia and the rest of the region, um, countries in the region, we see that um, we also experience um, a temporary of inflation, a lower inflation rate in 2023, but again, prices remain elevated above pre-pandemic levels. Um, we've zeroed in a bit on the specific region, the sub-region, the ECCU, where we have shown you on the graph on the left here that um, all countries experience um, and that, that escalation in inflation in 2022, and we see some signs, some early signs of a sustained decrease um, in 2023, more so in the second half of 2023. Um, in Dominica, for instance, we see here that the rate has moved from 9% when we compare June of 2023 to June of 2022 um, to just about 3.6%. And the same in Antigua, from 10.5% to just about 2.8%. Um, St. Lucia has a similar trend as is the other countries except for a few countries where we see a very a similar performance for inflation, um, more so in Barbados when we get to the non-ECCU um, discussion. Um, so for the year as a whole, um, for all of 2023, including the projection for the last quarter of 2023, we see here a similar pattern as we saw in the global economy, that inflation would have peaked in almost all the countries in the region in 2022 and come down, started to come down in 2023. Um, so for St. Lucia, um, we see here similar pattern as the other countries, and also in the non-ECCU countries, um, Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana. Barbados would have a, a, some of an exception in the sense that it had experienced um, some effects from the tropical storms on some of the adverse weather patterns which affected agricultural produce in that country. And also there was a rapid increase in the demand for services um, when the economy actually opened up somewhat later than St. Lucia. In terms of the, how all of that has actually come to bear on St. Lucia's economy and what we have experienced here in St. Lucia regarding the price movement, we see a similar pattern that prices are beginning to increase at a slower rate, um, but still remain at, at, at much higher levels than an average consumer would, would like. 
Um, so of course, being open and vulnerable to all of the vagaries in the international environment, we see here that the global monetary policy um, does have an effect with a lag um, in St. Lucia. We also see that the movement in the freight costs has an impact on our imported price of goods. Um, we also see here that the increase in production um, would have been affected by higher electricity costs and transport costs and raw materials as well in 2022. And the reverse would have happened in 2023. We would have seen that, for instance, electricity costs closely linked to the cost of crude oil prices would have gone down in 2023 vis-a-vis -vis 2022. Um, and there are also some other factors that, is, that are domestic and specific to the region in St. Lucia that would have created um, inflationary um, pressures. Um, we'd have seen, I mean, when as persons, small persons came back to work um, following the COVID um, lockdowns in St. Lucia, employment increased, and with that um, led to increased aggregate in income amongst persons. There's people who have more money to spend. And that would have actually put pressure on um, the prices as demand would have been high. Um, we also see some effects on agricultural produce, where the availability of some of the produce would have been affected by tropical storm bread um, earlier in 2023, and with that, we'd have seen some increases in agriculture prices. Um, we also have another factor that affects inflation domestically and everywhere else, is also any movements in the government's tax policy and the tax increases would also um, tend to contribute to an increase in, in prices. And we also see here that persons' ability to spend is also affected by the, any increase that's been given in credit, whether it's through the form of loans for credit unions, banks, and other financial institutions would help increase demand and thereby put upward pressure on prices. Um, so in St. Lucia, um, we see here as at September, um, when we compare September with September, we see that um, the inflation rate would have gone down from 7.6% a year ago to just about 2%, 2.6% 2 in 2023. And the major components of that um, really is uh, the food, would have contributed to about a quarter of the of the, the increases that we'd have seen. And we also see here in St. Lucia that um, the same one, one of the same factors that contributed to the increase in 2022, which is um, utilities and gas and fuels, would have been reversed to some extent um, where we saw decreases in, the, in this product in 2023. And that would have contributed to the slowing down of the rate of increase in prices in St. Lucia. Um, just to illustrate here more specifically what has happened with a major input cost that most persons deem to be very high in St. Lucia, which affects production costs, as well as affects um, households in the form of the residential electricity bills. And um, we could see here that the domestic rates, the graph on the left, would have shown there by the dotted line in red that the uh, electricity rates are substantially lower in 2023 from, the, from April um, compared to the same months um, in 2022. And that, again, is as a result of the decline in world oil prices, which is reflected in the decline in the price at which Lucilec would have imported diesel um, to generate electricity in St. Lucia. And there's an almost an immediate pass-through with a, about a month lag um, that where consumers actually see that reflected on their bills through what is called uh, the surcharge that re really reflects the adjustments in the imported price of, of diesel. And a similar pattern was seen for commercial rates which is the cost, which affects the cost of production of goods and services in St. Lucia. So businesses would have benefited or would have gotten some sort of relief um, in 2023 um, from a slightly lower oil prices, which are down by about, sorry, electricity prices, down about 5% in 2023 vis-a-vis -vis 2022. Um, for St. Lucia overall, as we would have shared earlier for the other countries, um, we expect that on average, that the consumer price index would have changed or increased by just about 4.2%, and that compares with a, a high of 6.4 in 2022. So we do see that the, the rate of inflation is, is coming down, but it's still not at the rate as pre-COVID levels. Um, prior to COVID, or even during COVID, we had some years of um, what we call deflation, where prices actually declined. Um, but for the most part, uh, we are still above um, the, the desired rate of inflation. And we do expect that to continue to fall gradually into the next year. coming. So in terms of having that experience with inflation, in particular in 2022 and it's continued in 2023, um, the question then is what has the government done um, to basically provide some relief and to cushion consumers from the effects 
of this, of, of this rising prices. Um, the minister would have touched on some of it, but I guess I will take, take you through some additional measures that were, that, that were undertaken. Um, the Ministry of Freedom, Ministry of Commerce, um, there were elevated levels of subsidies on the rice, flour, and sugar. Um, the government warehouse would have purchased um, the particularly flour um, at a much higher price um, in 2022 and kept prices domestically unchanged for quite a while um, before the prices were increased to a very small extent and still way below the price at which the government actually purchases um, those bulk items. Um, so sugar, to some extent, was also um, subsidized and also rice. In total, the government would have spent just approximately $15 million in the fiscal year 22-23 on subsidizing those items. And um, with a slight increase in um, the retail price of some of them, we'd have seen that the costs would have gone down, but still very high at $11 million in this financial year 23-24. The government would have also undertaken to waive the 6% custom service charge that at the border on the imports of price control items during the months of June to October of 2022. Also, in order to assist um, some government workers in, in the cost of transport and the ease of transport, the government would have actually provided vehicle ex concessions um, to some categories of workers, um, travel officers, customs officers, correctional officers, um, essential workers like doctors, nurses, police officers. And also the government would have actually given two sorts of one-off increases to pensioners whose incomes are fixed. These are pensioners in the government payroll. And um, we'd have seen an increase of a one, uh, it's granted to pensioners of about $600 um, in October of 2022 and in November of 2023, both costing, together costing just about um, $3.5 million in total. And of course, the government subsidy on LPG um, continued uh, but it was also increased significantly, given that the price of oil, or the imported price of cooking gas, would have gone up significantly in 22-23. So the government would have subsidized on average the price of the 20 pound cooking gas cylinder um, by almost $20 a cylinder. And um, while it has gone down a bit in 23-24, in this financial year, it is still high as at $15 per cylinder. That has cost the government um, just about 13 million in the year 22-23, and just about 11 million is projected for this financial year, 23-24. Added to that, and to assist um, persons in, a, in, in, in coping with the inflationary situation, um, the government would have actually honored the, the agreed salary increases and paid those increases that were deferred um, for the triennium 2019-20 to 21-22. And these were all paid um, for the last two years of the triennium um, in the year 22-23. For this year, 2023 more specifically, the government would have continued its efforts to provide relief by embarking on personal income tax reform, whereas persons were, many persons were taken off the tax net. They were not subject, their salaries were not subjected to the payment of income tax, and the government would have done that by increasing the threshold um, from 18,000 to 25,000, meaning that for all persons now earning um, 25,000 and less would be paying no income tax. So that has provided a lot of relief um, to persons um, in terms of providing them with additional spending power. Um, and that started in January of 2023. Um, furthermore, in the government's um, budget announcements um, this year, the government would have implemented the waiver of BAT on building materials, select building materials for a period of two years from August of 2025. And a similar thing was done for um, solar PV systems to help persons from a lot more long-term view reduce their electricity bills by beginning to invest in solar PV systems and also contributing to the agenda and the mandate for climate change um, compliance. The government also um, this month would have, as, as announced, also provide, is, is about to provide many taxpayers with income tax relief, income tax refund, sorry, um, in the order of about 10 million, additional $10 million um, in the form of income tax refunds. In a given year, the government normally budgets about $10 million for income tax refunds, but for this financial year, the, that budget is expected to more than double um, to basically help persons um, to have additional spending power at this point in time. 
Additionally, um, for producers in the agricultural sector, the government would have increased the fuel rebate to fishermen from $1 to $2.50 per gallon, and also the teacher material allowance that's given in every September, August, September, um, was increased by $600 to $1,400 to every teacher um, at a cost to the government. Uh, in terms of the inflationary environment um, now and where we see things, prices heading, um, more globally and also, of course, in St. Lucia, we expect that prices will continue to actually, de the, the rate of increase in prices, which is inflation, is expected to de continue to decrease. And this term is normally called disinflation. Um, it is not deflation, but it's disinflation, where prices are still increasing, but it's coming, it's increasing at a slower, at a slower rate. Um, globally, we expect that prices would, the inflation rate is expected to basically move from 6.9% in 2023 um, to just about, I can't see the screen, 5.8. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's about 5.8%. And um, for the fall, the years beyond that in 2025, it is expected to move towards the inflation targets of about 2% um, in going forward. And we see the same thing, particularly this, this efforts have been led by the, by the US, the largest economy in the world, the US economy. And we have heard in the news yesterday um, when the Federal Reserve signal that although they've continued the pause, a pause in interest rates increases, that there is a possibility that there may be um, interest rate decreases in 2024. Um, but that remains um, to be seen and hereby um, contribute to a spiral or basically set in motion uh, the tra transmission mechanism for inflationary pressures to increase even further. Also added to that, we have what's happening in China, which is the second largest economy in the world, where China's economic issues um, with the real estate sector um, has presented some problems and has been a drag on the economy, um, and that is also presenting some downward pressure as well on prices. Um, so with that, we expect that um, in St. Lucia, that inflation is likely to return to its, its pre-COVID norms of just around two, between two to three percent in 2024. But again, of course, that is subject to many different risks. Um, we have, of course, the many ongoing wars around the world. Um, if there's any escalation in the Ukraine-Russia war, um, also the Hamas-Israel war, and also more closer to us, um, how the issue with Venezuela and Guyana plays out, we may experience additional inflationary pressures for some periods of time in 2024. Also, um, Asia, sorry, R Russia and Saudi Arabia have continued the efforts to basically constrict or reduce the supply of oil so as to increase the price at which oil is being sold. Um, that any further increases in the cuts, production cuts, could cause inflation if that, these cuts are not made up by excess production elsewhere around the world. And of course we have the tensions between China and Taiwan. Um, China, China being a major producer of goods across the world. Um, that could affect the availability and the distribution of goods and also the prices. And we're also vulnerable to natural disasters with all and climate change effects could continue to disrupt the supply and, of and price of agricultural produce. And we also have the factors regarding wages um, could also contribute to higher increases in the prices. But again, like I indicated just a while ago, that are there any, any changes in the, in the sentiments by the central banks around the world to um, not only just stop the increases in interest rates, but to basically decrease that that would also contribute to an additional um, pressure to bring prices down around the world. So with that, I will conclude by saying that inflationary pressures are expected to persist, but at a much more subdued rate. And also just to, for um, the listeners to bear in mind that while the government has done and undertaken several measures to mitigate the effects of inflation, we need to also be mindful of the fact that the government has to pursue many different object macroeconomic objectives quite apart from providing a scene after price stability and maintaining macroeconomic stability in general, the government um, not only would seek to provide relief to consumers, but the government also has to generate sufficient revenue to cover the cost of the production of goods and services and its operations in general. That is for education, health, security, and the like. And um, the government also has to keep a very close eye 
on its um, maintaining fiscal and debt sustainability so that the government could basically continue to have access to concessional sources of financing and to reduce its borrowing cost. So with that, I will stop and pause here and allow um, the second presenter um, to continue the discussion. Thank you. to adopt the protocol that has been established in, in um, acknowledging the presence of the Minister, Honorable uh, Hippolyt, uh, Minister of Commerce, our distinguished uh, panelist and the moderator, and um, of course our in-house uh, guests and those of you joining us uh, online. Um, I could say to you uh, that I'll be rather brief, a lot shorter. Um, I know we have had quite a, a, a full uh, treatment of, of, of um, the, the drivers and sources of inflation that we have observed for the last two years. Um, in this presentation, I will just um, try to focus more on what we call the uh, sort of a micro perspective, um, bringing the lens of scrutiny uh, to bear closer on the actual products that we consume, and which I think might be of interest to uh, most of you. Um, you would understand, um, of course, our price build-up process as a small open economy. We have imported goods um, that land at our shores uh, with something called the CIF uh, value, which is cost insurance freight, and you heard about freight early on, and I'll come to that a bit later on, uh, which serve as our input prices, to which uh, border charges, uh, charges are added to give us something called landed costs, and, and then thereafter the uh, business or importer would apply some level of margin to cover costs and remain profitable. Um, the Ministry of Commerce, um, through its Department of Consumer Affairs, um, basically has the, the mandate um, to promote consumer welfare, and um, um, as you can, as we indicated early on, but also um, to pay attention to the environment to ensure our businesses are also uh, thriving and um, in, in a sort of supportive environment. But in this occasion, our focus is on the consumer welfare aspect of our mandate. Um, um, that is done through the Distribution and Price of Goods Act, uh, Cap 13 of 09. Now, here we spend some time looking at uh, monitoring prices, uh, prices in particular those on the price uh, control list. Um, so I'll start looking at this. I'll start with um, Oil, cooking oil. Uh, cooking oil, we saw that the price of cooking oil um, climbed from about $17 to about 45 It more than doubled, um, an increase of over 165%. And that, if you notice the period uh, from about April uh, 2020, which is in the sort of in the middle of the COVID era uh, period, right up to $45.80 in, in, in December of 2022, which is last year. So we had a precipitous rise. Um, again, similar pattern, um, pasta, another product that is widely consumed in our, uh, our diet. Um, again, starting from about March, which is in the COVID era, um, for various reasons, increased to about $30.81 over um, up, up to last month. Now, I want to say something about pasta. Pasta is a, a product that is subjected to a special regime uh, in the region. We have something called, um, in CARICOM, Article 164, where we seek to promote industrial development in LDCs, including St. Lucia, so domestic pro producers benefit from some tariff protection. And that, too, is, um, might be included there, especially on imported varieties. 
Tuna fish is, a, is a, um, one of a commonly used um, source of protein. Uh, prices here also increase on 3.5 ounce tins of tuna, starting from an average price of about 2.53, uh, $2.53, um, up to about a high of 3.5. Now, I want you to bear, bear, bear in mind that this is a price control item. So it means that there's just a, a fixed percentage margin, wholesale and retail margin. And if it increases, it can only increase for one reason, that is the CIF value would have had to increase, the input price. And that, and that is what this is really showing us. Um, but again, the same pattern that was alluded to early on by the Ministry of Finance, from about uh, this uh, September, last quarter of uh, last year, into the, the first quarter, we saw the general deceleration of prices um, trending downwards, okay? Um, another, we go to hygiene and sanitary product, toilet soap. There are two, same pattern. We see that the retail price of soap are going from an average of $2.34 uh, a bar to $3.09. Um, uh, cornflakes, a cereal, a breakfast, breakfast item. Uh, we see various brands and sizes of cornflakes also demonstrate a general upward trend of about a 5% increase uh, every few months. Um, so we see that general pattern holding across different sample, a sample of different products, whether they be um, hygiene, um, <coughs> dietary or otherwise. Now I want to jump ahead to another point that was alluded to earlier on as a driver of, of cost, and that is um, freight or shipping costs. And the reasons for that have, have been um, discussed, um, bottlenecks at ports, um, you know, as a result of the public health measures that would have affected um, uh, workers and created labor shortages. We had truck drivers unavailable, containers and so forth. All of those factors would have affected um, scheduling of, 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 um, of ship deliveries and so forth. And so that is an, a major factor. But in particular, we saw from the U.S. market, which is our main trading partner, um, that Prices again climbed from uh, March of uh, 2021 all of the way to December of 2022. But after that, we saw some sort of a leveling off and um, a slightly um, trending downwards slightly. It was a more precipitous climb in China, um, starting from about uh, mid-2020, from about 12,000 EC thereabout. Uh, and, and the prices increased steadily throughout um, 2021 to a maximum of about 39,000 in January of 2022. Quite a climb. Um, and thereafter, you saw the same pattern, um, prices of freight, uh, cost of freight, sorry, I'm um, going down um, to uh, leveling off to about um, $18,474 for a 40-foot container of, of um, goods up out of China. So in essence, ocean freight costs really um, has, has shown the effects of the pandemic, um, uh, climbing, as I said, high up to about US um, $14,640. And, um, and in, the US, in the US market, from about $4,225. Um, thereafter, um, petering out or, 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 or increasing at a slower rate and coming down, as I indicated. Um, the reasons for that have already been dis discussed earlier on. So in summary, and I know people like that word, <laughs> in practice, um, the, the pattern of price movements have been largely the same and increased during the sort of COVID era. And, and depending on the rate at which inter measures take effect, sometimes with a lag, we can see um, the peaks being um, probably a quarter or two different in terms of the time and thereafter trending downwards to where we are. Because essentially, all agencies, all companies are taking action. They're all acting to try to uh, correct the imbalance, correct the, the, the dislocation, minimize the dislocation. But there's government policy, we, saw, uh, we heard about central banks, um, and companies also trying to um, remain viable by being competitive. So all of these things have helped to bring price down. But there's another fac factor I want to draw to your attention. Despite the reduction in freight costs, 
prices, the CIF values are still somewhat higher than pre-COVID levels, and that's why we say prices are sticky downwards. Unless we have some mechanisms to ensure pass-through, um, we don't have the full pass-through, some of the companies may internalize what we call the economic rents. Um, so that is the anatomy, that is the story, ladies and gentlemen, of, of the inflation experience that we have had. Um, um, I could say to you the ministry is um, committed to continue to monitor um, prices, and, and as, as the minister indicated in her remarks, will stands ready to take any sort of um, additional action that may be necessary in the fiscal year 2024-25. Um, um, and, and finally, um, another aspect of this issue is that we intend to uh, continue to work to enhance First of all, the ministry's capacity in competition, as well as to establish the necessary legislative and regulatory framework to help e better enforce competition policy and rules, uh, and to ensure fair trading and ethical business conduct in Saint With these few words, I want to thank you for your attention, and I would now hand you over to the permanent secretary. Thank you very much for your attention. And a few days ago, somebody said to me, I just want to know what will be done about these prices, for the prices to decrease in the supermarket, et cetera. But you could, from the presentations, I'm sure you'll agree, this is not a simple matter. And a lot has been done to date to offer some relief, um, to give consumers more spending power. At this time, I'd like to introduce the members of our panel. We look forward to the presentation. I don't know what, they, what will be the contribution. I look forward to their presentation. Um, I'll begin with our moderator. Dr. Adrian Auger is an economic development consultant with extensive private and public sector experience across the Caribbean and beyond. He has worked as an economist with the governments of St. Lucia and Grenada, the World Bank, the European Union, UNCTAD, USAID, CARICOM, and the OECS. As Chief Economist in the Ministry of Finance and Planning, Dr. Oje served as Economic Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, establishing the Office of Private Sector Relations, OPSR, and designing and implementing the country's first private sector development strategy. He also served as Deputy National Authorizing Officer for St. Lucia's Official Grant Assistance Program, with the European Union and was the architect and first secretary general of St. Lucia's National Economic Council. He's a former executive director and vice president of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture, an institution that he helped to transform during his five year tenure. Dr. Oshé has worked at the World Bank as an economic assistant to the executive director for Canada, Ireland and the Caribbean and has served as director on the boards of several public institutions and private companies. He's currently a director of Surgical Life Eastern Caribbean, the JQ Charles Group of Companies and Landmark Group, of which he is chair and founder. Poet, playwright, producer, mass man, and cultural activist, Dr. Oje St. Lucia's first Caribbean laureate of arts and letters and has been conferred with several prestigious awards, including the St. Lucia Medal of Merit Gold, Service Exporter of the Year 20, 2009, Entrepreneur of the Year 2010, and an honorary doctorate from the University of the West Indies. Join me in welcoming Dr. Oje, our moderator for today. Mm -hmm. Active in the fields of private sector development, 
business advocacy, business support services, trade negotiations, export development, sustainable development, development planning, and competitiveness throughout his professional career. Mr. Luizzi has a first degree in economics from Syracuse University in New York and a master's degree in national development and project planning from Bradford University in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Mr. Luizzi. Our next panelist, Mr. Jason King, is a chartered accountant with 28 years of experience in the accounting and finance profession. He has been the chief financial officer of the St. Lucia Distillers Group of Companies for the past 12 years and also serves in the role of company secretary. He previously worked at the St. Lucia NC Port Authority for nearly 16 years, serving as a deputy financial controller for the last seven years of his tenure. Which, he include, which included performing the role of financial analyst. Mr. King is currently the second vice president of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, Industry, and Agriculture, and serves on the executive of the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association as treasurer, positions he has held for several years. He's a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants and has an MBA from the University of Leicester. Join me in welcoming Mr. Jason King, our next panelist. Our sole female panelist for today, Dr. Tecla Fitz-Lewis. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fitz-Lewis is a distinguished professional whose extensive educational journey and over three decades of executive experience have solidified her reputation as a prominent figure in management consultancy business development strategies, and human resource development. Her academic accolades include the attainment of a master's and doctorate from the University of Leicester in the UK and Walden University in the USA, respectively, complemented by an array of certifications spanning various fields from strategic human resource management and developmental training, management consultancy, leadership and organizational psychology, international marketing, business administration, and hotel and restaurant technologies. Her diverse career path has seamlessly transitioned between the public and private sectors, showcasing her versatility. Certainly, Dr. Fitzlewis serves as, currently, sorry, Dr. Fitzlewis serves as the Director of Operations and Human Capital Management as, at Lewis Industries Limited in St. Lucia, and is also CEO and Principal Consultant of Lewis Management Consultancy Services. Furthermore, Dr. Fitzlewis' commitment to professional excellence is underscored by her active participation on numerous boards and within various professional affiliations. As a proud president of the National Consumer Association, she continues to champion consumer rights, exemplifying her dedication to personal and professional growth while consistently striving for excellence. Her active engagement in these organizations underscores her unwavering dedication to the development of people, organizations, and country. Let's welcome Dr. Fitzlewis. So I now move on. Zoom platform. I extend a warm welcome to Mr. Joseph Cox. He's the Assistant Secretary General, Economic Integration, Innovation and Development at the Caribbean Community Secretariat. An applied economist consultant and advocate with a career spanning 30 years, Mr. Joseph Cox is currently the Assistant Secretary General at CARICOM Secretariat in Georgetown, Guyana. A Jamaican national, he holds both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in economics from the University of the West Indies. His contribution to regional development has included the recent authoring of a book entitled The New Normal, a post-COVID primer for business, conceptualized and received unanimous approval from CoTed of the Made in CARICOM initiative. There's development and successful execution through the Caribbean Center Ren for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency of a Project Preparation Facility. Also, the development and implementation of a regional strategic 
Intervention Framework, dubbed the Program of Technical Assistance to CARICOM Territories, which boasts short, medium, and long-term intervention strategies designed to optimize economic impact in CARICOM member states, coupled with a robust monitoring and evaluation system. So prior to his CARICOM secretary at posting, Mr. Joseph Cox was a managing partner for the Center for Growth and Development in Jamaica, and also as the Executive Director, Growth Secretariat at the Planning Institute of Jamaica, and he provided oversight for the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, Government of Jamaica Competitiveness Enhancement Program. Join me in welcoming Mr. Joseph Cox, our virtual participant, well, our virtual panelist for today. Thank you, Mr. Cox, for joining us. And I'm sure you will agree this is a very knowledge, experience, rich panel. We had to sum up all of the, the bios, or else I would have taken hours to present. So we are very grateful, and we are very happy to have such an experienced group of of persons, experts, who will be discussing that topic of inflation and also to ensure at the end of the day are impacted by this, um, this evil, um, the secret thief it's called, or the quiet thief, um, inflation. Uh, I want to commend the, the ministries of finance and commerce for initiating this discussion. I think it's a matter that the public is deeply interested in every time they go to the shops, every time they look at an invoice, every time they consider their production curves, and so it is fitting that we should have this discussion and that we should have it as a community. So I think that's very good. Um, I would like to note that we are approximately 35 minutes behind time, and unless we're extending the closing, Madam Master of Ceremonies, I suggest that we use our time as profitably as possible. I would therefore like to um, welcome my fellow panelists and ask each one in the, in, the, in the order that we are seated to begin with some brief opening remarks, focusing, I presume, uh, primarily on their own sectors and their, and their institutional ins um, perspectives, and then we will go to a broader discussion on the various, on the various subtopics of inflation. So it is my pleasure to ask Mr. Brian Luisi, um, Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce, to lead us off. I think it's appropriate that he start, given his broader um, perspective on the private sector itself and the impact of inflation on a wide range of businesses um, across the economy. So over to you, Brian. aggravated customers because um, the fancy term inflation really translates into higher prices to the consumer every time they go shopping. Um, 
in the food sector. It is something that happens even more intensely because you buy food virtually every day, much more often. But um, those of us who have been brave enough to engage in even in some simple construction projects, we too see the price escalation that has taken place. And the chamber has phrased the problem as price escalation rather than just inflation because we have seen prices and the cost of doing business escalate. And the reality is that these costs are passed on to consumers. Um, we are very happy that the ministry has outlined very clearly um, the cause and the source of this um, price escalation we're experiencing. And so as our members have tried, um, the institution has tried, and one of the last things we did was recently um, talk to our members about looking at different sources of supply for their goods. At our last AGM um, two weeks ago, we started talking about the whole issue of Latin America as a source of supply so we could avoid some of the supply chain bottlenecks that people are experiencing, see lower costs of freight, but also see higher cost and better quality goods at a lower cost from Latin America. Because with the Russia war, with what's happening in, um, in, 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 the, in, the, um, in, in Israel, a lot of firms have already started shifting their, their manufacturing to Latin America, to Mexico, because they're seeing that they have an ability to avoid a lot of the problems they're seeing. And so we're joining that, that, that factor and trying to find solutions, find ways we can mitigate the price escalation we're seeing. So we're happy to be here, and we hope we can offer some positive comments to the whole discussion. Thank you, Brad. Moving right along, Mr. Jason King. Okay. So uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of local manufacturers. Um, which we, you know, have to grapple with. Now, of course, we need to remain, it's paramount that we remain competitive uh, in the local market and internationally. So the, it doesn't mean for us it's not an automatic decision of simply passing on costs. Uh, for various reasons, we, uh, we are often constrained in our ability to do so. Uh, because our, it is really the market forces that dictate the extent to which we can pass on costs that you know, dictate our pricing decisions. Uh, we compete, I mean, at, at a global level, really. Even when we compete in the local market, we are faced with competition from, you know, from imported products that are produced by global suppliers, global manufacturers that benefit from, you know, from economies of scale because they have huge factories compared to our, our tiny factories. They um, usually have lower energy costs and also lower labor costs. Sometimes uh, because of, uh, it's a combination of, of automation and genuinely lower wage, wage rates. So with all of these challenges, we, you know, we, we have to find a way, a way through, um, but it, it certainly is a challenge. The Ministry of Finance already you know, gave a lot of information about what drives inflation and drives those costs, but I can give you uh, maybe specific examples from where I sit. Like, um, so we heard about how you know, raw materials um, you know, have increased significantly, uh, the, the cost and then um, that was also driven by higher freight costs. Now for, in terms of raw materials, um, some of these are commodities. And commodities are particularly uh, affected by the rise in, uh, in shipping costs. I can give you an example. I mean, I am from, the, uh, from St. Lucia Distillers, and I can tell you that our, in 2022, the cost of molasses increased, it jumped by 51%, I mean, in one go. And for those of you who know a bit about uh, the production of alcohol, uh, molasses is the main ingredient in rum production. So you can see uh, how this would have impacted us. And it is not, again, as I say, it's not possible to simply pass that on. We wouldn't want to, and or in fact, we can't. So it means uh, having to absorb um, some of these costs. So while the consumers complain and rightly so at the um, increase in, uh, in prices, significant increases in the prices on the shelves of everything. Uh, but there must be an understanding that in fact, um, the businesses are not actually passing everything on. Um, at least most of them are not. Uh, it means um, lower margins for, for most of us and we just have to find a way to still keep our businesses running. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll be back on track very shortly. 
um, Tekla, if you can take over lead us through. Definitely. As the soul rose between the thorns, let me take the opportunity to join the moderator and my fellow panelists in congratulating the Ministry of Consumer Affairs in seeing the relevance of facilitating such a consultation um, through discussion this morning. Um, we recognize that inflation can have various effects on consumers, influencing their purchasing power, their savings, their overall financial well-being. However, my role this morning will be to show how consumers can play an effective role in light of inflation. Whilst inflation is primarily influenced by macroeconomic factors, which have been well articulated by the two speakers this morning, um, and factors which include government policies, consumers themselves can take certain steps to navigate and mitigate its impact on their personal finances. And the good thing is that consumers are also represented by my fellow panelists. Manufacturers are consumers. The members of the chamber are consumers. We all are consumers. So as we go through the process, I will highlight some ways that we consumers can play a role in inflation. Thank you very much. And now we have Mr. Joseph Cox, Assistant Secretary General, CARICOM, joining us virtually. Welcome, Mr. Cox. I should remind you that you are bound by the same time. Um, thank you very much. I, I trust you can hear me. You're hearing me? You're hearing me? Yes. Hearing me now, sir. Go ahead. All right. All wonderful. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you much. So um, much um, first of all, for, for, for inviting for us. Um, um, we do appreciate it. it. And of and course, I join you, join chair, in in your commendations of, of the the, the, the um, presenters, um, presenters earlier. earlier. And indeed, as I say, good morning to all present. I just want to make just a couple of observations because. My, my, perspective, my perspective, of course, perspective, of course, I'm not going to be speaking to the St. Lucian experience, Lucian but I will, but be, I looking will be looking, at, looking the at the issue right across, right across the region. region and and part, part of the part challenge of I think that we're facing, facing as we, as we will confront, confront the issue of inflation, inflation is also one of measurement. Because to be because frank to be with you, with in too in many, many countries, countries, the composition of the basket of goods that will be used as to determine, determine the index, index, and a lot of times, times they, um, they, are not, they are not updated in a timely manner. manner. The weightings are therefore are skewed, skewed, and therefore and we have some we challenges. Have some challenges. <laughs> so, so, so an issue where I would contend, um, just by looking at the information across the region, that there is need for us to have uh, producer price indices, because obviously the um, the price of the inputs that go into, for example, the manufacturing process will be slight, will not, not slight, will be completely different, I would think, um, from that would obtain to regular consumer items. So that's one aspect of it. We also have to look at the notion of um, efficiencies within our markets. There are great opportunities for um, um, you know, some, you know, some, some efficiencies, efficiencies to be realized. So, for, for example, example, coming out of the out COVID, of COVID experience, experience, there is a, go a, a golden opportunity right across this region, region for us for to us be to engaged be in, in um, near shoring, which, which the IDB from a recent from study, study has pointed to as a potential five billion US dollar, dollar market. market. There's also the, the, the other issue, the issue that I want to raise in this in opening this salvo, salvo as we look at matters, matters of, of efficiencies, efficiencies and, partnerships, and partnerships is that, is that for, example, for example in a number of of number of a number of scenarios the, the partnership, partnership between, between the government, the government and, the and the private sector becomes paramount. Because, because frankly because speaking, speaking, if the if the if the, if the, state, the state decides to waive to duties, duties, reduce duties, duties um, um, etc., et but then, but then the, what you have is basically a compensatory, compensatory um, um, 
mechanism being employed by the private sector if they are not on board with it you can end up nullifying the effects and therefore just giving away revenue for no reason so there is need for us to have a i would think a real detailed look at where the market is what is going on and of course i have to sympathize in some respects with both the the um producers as well as the, the policy makers because right across the region we are looking at probably a 40 to 60 percent um, informality um, rate. rate. Um, so um, I stop, stop there. there. I'm not hearing. hearing. We're hearing you. We're hearing okay. You. Okay. No, no, I don't mind. I, I, I'll stop there. Um, it's just, it's just to, to point out that um, because we have the high degrees of informality across the region, the policy making space becomes very, very challenging, and therefore we have to take that into consideration as well. Ask me to um, you know, further some of the points I raised. Um, I think these points will be discussed um, generally as we speak. But um, because we, we, have, we have a little high from the AGM and our discussion with Mexico and Brazil, um, I think there is potential because um, Brazil and Mexico are two of the largest economies and two of the largest exporters and manufacturers in the world, and they're number one and two in Latin America. Um, Brazil is one of the largest exporters to the US. Mexico as well. A lot of the products you buy from the US, much more than you believe, are manufactured in Mexico. Mexico is actively pursuing dealing with some of the logistic challenges of shipping from Mexico and not having to go through Miami. Mexico is the largest producer of white goods, for example. Refrigerators, televisions, washing machines, all of that. Mexico, I think, is the third or fourth largest exporter of agricultural products to the US. So I think there is real potential and there is real appetite in countries like Mexico. Mexico particularly has a different approach to how it deals with its international partners, and I think they are willing to work. So there's that. Brazil, I do think there is an issue that we have to look at with the Guyana-Venezuela um, challenge. But also people, a lot of people say, but Brazil is so far away. But that's if you're dealing with South Brazil. North Brazil, you have roadway, roadways straight into Guyana. That are already being explored and they've been exploited by certain countries in in the Caribbean. So I think, again, if our traditional suppliers are expensive and we, are, we have challenges getting from them, we need to raise our head and look otherwise. We have free trade agreements with Chile, with Costa Rica. These are booming manufacturing agencies. We have free trade agreements with Santo Domingo. I have argued that we need to revisit whether there is benefit in rethinking, especially in this crisis time, the need for us to, to have non-reciprocity in terms of whilst we can export duty-free to some of these countries, we don't have any obligation of being duty-free. But if 
there is a financial advantage to our consumers and our people, our, co our producers and whatnot. We should examine it. I mean, we may come to the point where it doesn't make sense, but we should not just think that the best way in a modern trade environment is non-reciprocity. Non I think we need to examine it. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. But how feasible do you think um, non-reciprocity is for us? I mean, it would constitute some kind of developmental transfer, concessionary um, trade agreement in our favor. Well, well, we already have free trade agreements with some of these countries. On a reciprocal on, basis. On a, on a re, well, on a non-reciprocal basis, where we, we don't pay duties if we export to them, and there are a whole yeah. line of items which we can charge we, we can charge duties on. Okay, so we need to examine that list. We need to examine if there is possible. So your, 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 your point there also raises the logistics of shipping. Now, one of the things that has plagued us with interregional um, trade has been the cost and frequency and reliability of shipping between even our countries of CARICOM. How do you see that um, emerging, changing um, in the environment today where we are seeing increased opportunities in terms of availability of product, yes, but the logistics of getting it from one country to the other, do you see that improving um, within the regional context? I think there's and enough- by region, I'm saying Caribbean, yeah, Caribbean. And America. Yeah, I think there's enough work being done for us to see um, incremental movement. We're not gonna have a wholesale shift, a wholesale improvement. If, however, we're seeing St. Vincent, we're seeing Antigua, you're seeing Trinidad, benefiting from trading and shipping from these markets, it is not impossible or worth, not worth our while to explore. Okay, so, so before we move, just talk a little bit about developing a critical mass because it clearly, if we take this on a regional basis, whereas a region we are looking to shift trading patterns, then there's going to be a critical mass of goods moving such that shipping lines and, and tra traders and brokers and people like wholesalers are going to be more interested in targeting that, that end of the market. So, and remember we're talking to our domestic audience as well, break it down and outline what you see as the likely sequence of events sh for shifting sourcing from crisis areas like the Middle East. How do you see that playing out in real practical terms for our governments and eventually for our consumers? I, I truly believe that um, legislation and institutional changes follow action. So we are already seeing without the ideal situation in legislation and infrastructure, it's starting to happen. We are seeing the major developing countries, the US and European countries, shifting production to Mexico for that very same reason. Mexico itself, Latin America itself, is, has, has been promoting, and they are promoting even more, South-South trade as a, as a philosophical approach to development. We are seeing persons already doing it through Brazil. Um, just when I was making contact to have um, Apex, which is the Brazilian Industrial and Export Promotion Agency speak to us. I was put in touch with somebody who's already doing it as a business. So I think it can be done. Again, I'm saying if we are first to market, St. Lucia is well located to be the hub for the South Caribbean, for the Eastern Caribbean, as we have a duty-free zone. What is the potential of utilizing that? So I think there needs to be some intellectual capital invested in looking at the situation and not being deterred that we don't have this, we don't have that. A lot of things we have, we didn't have before. It takes some work to get it started and get it going. Okay, excellent. So I'm hoping we're gonna have time to come back to this concept of hubbing through St. Lucia because we have been talking about this. We had the, the proposal for a cul-de-sac industrial zone, which has altered. Um, we've had um, the Viewfort. industrial zone in Viewford, which has uh, slowed down a little bit, I think. Um, but clearly, we have some of the infrastructural links that we need to, to develop that critical mass. If, if, if the market is, in fact, transforming and repositioning, then hopefully government action can follow. Um, Mr. King, um, you mentioned energy costs and uh, among some of the determinants. 
I wanted to ask um, and hopefully generate some discussion. And other panelists, please, you don't have to sit there and wait for me. I mean, jump in if you can. Um, productivity of labor, and you're in manufacturing, has to be one of the efficiencies that we can build on, which of course will make our uh, productive sectors more competitive. Could you speak a little bit about the productivity, productivity of labor? And particularly how we position our human resource in terms of what's happening in the fields of automation and artificial intelligence. And, and just so that we can make the link clear, I mean, we speak about inputs to the manufacturing process being capital, equipment, and the hard stuff, but there's also the softer side, which is the human element, and the cost of labor and what it produces it's got to be one of the determinants of how price and competitiveness um, are moving. So if you could address that a little bit, um, we would be most grateful. Okay, uh, so you asked about, uh, about productivity, productivity of labor. Um, yes, it is uh, certainly manufacturers are, are no different to you know, the other businesses in Timbuktu where we, uh, it is a challenge. challenge we face is that we find that uh, in terms of recruitment, when we uh, we try to get the best uh, talent available, you know, young, young minds, uh, people are ready to work. But we find that in terms of the... Okay, in terms of the, the skills required to do, you know, to perform uh, the uh, skill tasks, uh, we find that the there is uh, still a lot of training that's required. In other words, the workers that we get, they are not adequately prepared uh, you know, from, I guess, the leading institutions uh, to be ready to work. And, well, there are, there are two aspects to it. One would be the actual skill, and the other would be the actual um, ethic, uh, work ethic. Uh, so we find that recruitment is, um, you know, getting the right people is becoming uh, more and more of a challenge. Uh, the issue isn't really the the wage rate at the moment, I think, uh, although, I mean, there is, I know there is discussion about a minimum wage. Uh, I will not really get into that, except to say that uh, while I am not, uh, but I think the manufacturers generally are not against uh, minimum wage, but w we are aware that care must be taken in uh, whatever decisions are made, because if, um, while the intention is to to improve the, uh, you know, the ability of uh, certainly maybe uh, entry level, uh, low level workers, you know, to be able to help them to face the, the increased cost of living. But if the uh, minimum wage causes the a, a, a general increase in wage rates, uh, then that in itself could cause further inflation because then, of course, our businesses would have to try to recover. But anyway, back to uh, the question at hand. Uh, yes, so productivity, getting the most productivity out of our employees is a challenge. We do what we can. As manufacturers, we provide uh, the necessary trading, but then the work ethic continues to be an issue. I think uh, there needs to be an examination of really uh, how well our young people are prepared uh, in the learning institutions to enter the workforce to really be effective. Now, you mentioned, you asked about automation. Yes, now, automation certainly is, uh, is effective at reducing the, at lowering the, the unit cost of production, and that's what we see happening in the developed countries. In a place like St. Lucia, it is not quite as practical because automation is really only beneficial if you have the required uh, scale of production. Uh, in other words, there, there is really a, a critical mass you better reach in production volume for automation to really be beneficial. Otherwise, it actually ends up being more expensive. Now, the way in which, I mean, St. Lucia has a, a relatively small population. Uh, so manufacturers, most local manufacturers would probably not be able to reach the required level of production volume if uh, what they do is primarily supply the local market. So that means exports. Exports are, are critical. Uh, for really the growth and success of any manufacturer locally. I would, uh, I appreciate the fact that the government
government. Uh, I mean, through experts in Russia, they've provided a lot of support to uh, manufacturers, getting them ready, especially the small manufacturers, getting them ready to enter export markets. Uh, but while exports in Russia is helping, there are other agencies that at times uh, create impediments to the easy flow of exports. Uh, I will not get into details, but uh, these are things that sometimes concern us, and we there must be a, there must be a, a realization by all of the agencies, by the government and everyone else, that exports benefit everyone. So there should not be any kind of impediment. Uh, I think there should be full cooperation uh, so that exports can be maximized. In terms of AI, uh, yes, well, again, that is something that can improve productivity. My opinion, in my opinion, I do not think as St. Lucians, we, uh, we are very quick to grasp, uh, we are not among the first to grasp all of the technological advances. Uh, we tend to, to, be fo to fall behind. Uh, I think COVID was an example. Well, in a way, I think COVID, one of the benefits of COVID was that it forced us to, to actually uh, look at and apply a number of technological advances, especially in communication and other things that we otherwise would probably have ignored. So AI is the next, I mean, the, the AI is where the world is going, and I would not want us to be lagging behind as usual. We need to be among those uh, who are eager to see how we can exploit it to our benefit. But we are not, as far as I'm aware, uh, there is very uh, limited use of AI, if any. Um, so that's something we need to change locally. Okay, so um, the minister and I believe um, the Madam, not Madam Chair, Madam um, yes. Master of Ceremonies um, asked us for unfettered discussion. I took that very seriously. So without putting you entirely in the fire, I would like you to give us one example of how we can have better coordination between um, government agencies that would impact um, your members in terms of keeping costs down um, improving processes and reducing the impacts of inflation. Okay, well, there is, uh, of course, we all know about the. Go ahead. Yes, we all know about the health and uh, citizen, uh, uh, the citizen security, security levy. Uh, I must say, I appreciate the fact that uh, manufacturers. Manufacturers are appreciative of the fact that the government of Sunusha agreed not to apply the levy on imported raw materials and packaging materials for the most part, uh, because that would have driven up our production costs and therefore our prices. Um, however, there is still the, uh, the fact that it is being applied on services, so it, we will still see an increase in cost, but uh, it will not be as significant as for maybe other businesses. However, there is, uh, in the pipeline, there is legislation for a uh, type of tax on plastic bottles. Now, I understand, of course, I understand the intent of such a law. I understand it, it has merit, but it will invariably cause the cost of production for manufacturers who use uh, plastic, plastic bottles to, you know, to package their products. It will invariably cause those prices to go up. Um, so that is something we are a bit concerned about, but there is, there has been a lot of dialogue. Uh, when I mention exports and impediments to that, I, well, I can probably give a little more detail. Uh, there is, uh, there are certain requirements that are sometimes placed on exports uh, that do not necessarily, uh, these are not requirements. So these are requirements placed by local agencies which would cause manufacturers to have to, to uh, comply to certain things that do not actually are not required by, uh, by the, the markets to which we are exporting. So I'm saying there is really no benefit uh, to trade. Uh, there, it, it does not actually, you know, uh, it's not a benefit to anyone. And it would push up your cost. And yes, it can push up our cost. Sometimes it might not seem so obvious, but if it requires um, extra procedures, then it, layer, it yes. definitely brings up the cost. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that we've got to look um, overall at the demands we're putting on the productive sector to comply, um, to adjust, etc., to pay or meet additional costs 
um, in terms of the competitiveness of their products. Yes, and we should always on consider on relevance. Uh, I mean relevance. So I'm speaking of a situation where um, what is being the requirement that was imposed is, is it's not relevant. Okay, so maybe we'll come back to the business of conflicting policy agendas um, and whether or not things are being considered across the broad macroeconomic spectrum or whether it's being considered on a ministry by ministry basis. We'll come back to that. Um, Tekla, perhaps that's a good place for us to continue some of the points that you raised, particularly um, where you indicated. Okay. Yeah, particularly where you indicated that, that all of us play different roles. So um, we, are, we are all producers of labor at the very least. Um, we are all consumers. Um, some of us have multiple hats and who we are sitting behind the desk may not be who we are at the supermarket. Or we're all taxpayers, we're all employees or em and sometimes employers as well. Could you speak a little bit about those cross um, purposes in the context of your consumer oriented um, functions? Okay, so naturally a consumer is one who uses products or services. So in any angle that the discussion takes, the consumer is affected, be it a manufacturer, be it an employer, be it an employee. We have to look at how does inflation inf affect consumers. I mean, we have recognized that it's not a government of sin problem, it's a global problem and the ministry have outlined some of the steps the government has taken to cushion that problem. But how does it affect us as consumers? We, we have reduced purchasing power, whether it's from a manufacturer buying raw materials or consumer purchasing from a retailer. As the prices and goods and services rise as a, due to inflation, the purchasing power of money decreases. Consumers may find the same amount of money by fewer goods, and as Jason said, as manufacturers, because those raw materials rise, they buy it, however, they have to cushion the cost of the increase to the consumers, and we speak in the case of molasses as a raw material to production of rum. It erodes savings, so it means an entrepreneur, business owner, will feel some form of impact. That impact would also redound on the consumer. The consumer meaning the person who does the purchasing of those goods or services. If the rate of inflation increases, then of course your purchasing power or your savings will decrease. Economies of scale. This can affect long-term financial goals and retirement planning. It impacts fixed incomes. Because of course, as the, the increase of good and, uh, goods and services rise, we see that wages and salaries do not follow suit. It is not possible. This can affect long-term financial goals. This can affect the ability for persons to maintain their lifestyle. And also it can compromise a business person's choice of whether you increase your goods or services to follow or cushion the blow to ensure that you can maintain competitiveness and a consumer base. Um, we see interest rates rising and the borrowing costs. Of course, loan sharks capitalize on that. We have several loan sharks that recognize that persons need to have alternative income, alternative forms of finance and these interest rates rise. This puts a consumer into a poorer perspective because you must borrow to meet your standard of living. And we have impact on investments. Do you make a choice of investing at this time? While certain assets may provide a hedge against inflation, you have other fixed incomes that may not keep the pace of rising costs. And this can, that can be an impact as well. Um, you have shifts in consumer behavior. And from the National Consumer Association's perspective, one of the strategies we have embarked on is to educate our consumers. Education is very important and advocacy. Under advocacy, we are now on a campaign to increase membership. Because with numbers, you have a voice. We have seen it happen. 
in 2001-2002, the Consumer Association was advocating for a Consumer Protection Bill. That was, government gave us the time of day. It was actually enacted in 2022 when this administration came into power. Again, it can only happen when you have persons who can advocate accordingly. In terms of consumer education, we want consumers to use objectivity in their spending. Spend on the things that you need, not the things that you want. That's very important for us. Budgeting is important. Financial planning is important. Making a choice as to where you can get the best value for your money is very important. So you look for institutions that may offer you discounts, institutions that may offer promotions. What is the best choice of your spending online, locally? These are very important for us as an association to ensure that our consumers understand that the inflation rates are nothing that we can control. Again, we have seen so many or heard so many examples of how it's affected by our macro environment. So we have to make a concerted decision in understand how we can mitigate against inflation by the choices that we make as consumers. Excellent. So difficult question, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Um, as we shift our patterns of expenditure, our patterns of shopping, of buying, of borrowing, um, what do you tell your, your members, your consumers, about the, the cost of higher purchase, for example, where you're facing rates upward of 25, 30%? Um, do you advise them to delay expenditure? Do you advise them to reconsider that, that new purchase um, in the scope of other priorities? And, and also, Considering that border taxes constitute a large percentage of the final cost of goods, are we, in fact, contributing to a situation where consumers cannot afford certain categories of expenses and so they are finding themselves at the mercy of, uh, say, higher purchase um, arrangements which have very high um, uh, interest charges? What do you say to your people about that? What I would say to my people, we have options. Again, it's choices. Consumers always have a choice. And that's one of the objectives of the Consumer Bill, our rights and our responsibilities and our choices. We have the choice to purchase in bulk. You purchase in bulk, you pay cheaper. I mean, the government have done... If they don't have the cash to purchase in bulk. If they don't have the cash. It depends on what you want to purchase. Our, our stress as consumers is mainly food. Do we grow what we eat? We hardly grow what we eat. So our import bill will be high. And I have seen so many examples of where the Ministry of Agriculture have asked people to eat what you grow and grow what you eat. And we fail to do that as a, as a country, as an economy. So we rely on importation of food, which is very costly. And of course, you can say, mm, you must buy sardines. You don't have to buy sardines. You must buy pasta, you does not have to buy pasta. We can get starch and the, the carbohydrates we need from alternative sources of food that we can grow right here in St. Lucia. So we have a choice. I, 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 I just want to jump in and say that we produce pasta locally, so I think you should probably not use that as an example. <laughs> no, and even the local pasta we produce still has an exponential increase in price. Yes, true. Yes. Well, thanks. Um, we come back to that, I suspect, because I think that, that the cost of, the cost of um, financing across the economy is something that, that bids up everything, as does the cost of um, trading across borders. Um, we've ignored, or we've, we've, um, come back. we've ignored Mr. Cox for a little while, and I see, <laughs> I see him um, edging to, to, to jump in. So feel free, Mr. Cox, to jump in, and as you do, would you talk to us a little bit about the basket of goods and um, whether that needs updating across the region um, so that we have a more accurate measurement of inflation and, and whether or not there are, there are um, initiatives in, the, in combating inflation that need to be addressed um, regionally? Are there things that individual uh, member countries would not do as well alone that they should be doing together? and maybe the shift in, in, 
in sourcing um, supplies may be one of those things. So what do we need to do together and how does the basket of goods um, compilation get improved? Well, to, to, to be frank with you, the answer to your first question is a simple word. Yes. The baskets, by and large, baskets have to be re, um, recalibrated. We have to do the requisite household expenditure surveys. I would suggest those who that are, are out of date that they, they do so. You do have markets, for example, where persons would be referencing in the basket of goods items that, frankly speaking, demand is, is not really there anymore. The whole composition of it, if you look in, in some, some of the jurisdictions, you see rent being as low, or household expenses being as low as probably as 7 8%. The truth we spoke, with anybody there in your audience, ask yourself a simple question. Do you really spend 7% of your income on housing expenses, whether it be rental or mortgage or whatever it is? So that's one aspect of it. Now, in terms of what we can do, as I alluded to before, what we have to look at is, well, one, um, looking at the possibility of nearshoring, um, which is basically using our proximity. Because remember something, we are within a six hour flight radius of a market of, by and large, call it 250 million people, right? Um, so we can, well, but we have also in a lot of the countries unused capacity, warehousing capacity, other sets of um, other aspects of it, whereby we can um, create um, the market to produce some of the elements that would at least be the primary inputs um, into some of the, the, the manufactured goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As we learned, for example, coming out of COVID, right? We had a scenario whereby we saw an upsurge in electronic commerce because people, because of the supply chain issues, persons weren't able to access um, some of the stuff that they that they usually use. But who were the, which were the where were the primary um, who were the primary beneficiaries of it? China, Japan, United Kingdom, United States. Part of our challenge within the region is that. For whatever the reasons are, <clears throat> most of our businesses do not have a, a, a real online presence. That best um, for some of them that have like a static Facebook page, or for some they have absolutely no presence at all. Much less having anything to deal with um, an electronic payments platform. So that's another aspect of it. What we can also do is that we also have facilities where we can do production integration. You have certain elements that can be done across border and, and countries and markets need to, at least within the region, need to look at some of those aspects and see where the efficiencies can, can be brought to bear. The other part of it is that, um, and I know this is not probably the most um, comfortable conversation to have where this, is, where, where, where this obtains, but there is also an element of price gouging that is going on um, across our region. Um, and we have to also safeguard against that. There are, there are mechanisms that the state will have to ensure are effective to treat with some of these issues. Because honestly speaking, yes, the border taxes are an issue. Yes, um, you have other issues in terms of um, costs in terms of electricity costs, our region is notorious. We have the highest electricity rates across you know in, in the world. But the fact of life is none of that, and some can explain some of the the substantial. And I mean, when I say substantial, rather I'm saying substantial exponential increases that we have seen for some of the, the products. So the point that I'm making is that there is there there is a lot of there are a lot of um, areas for improvement. Um, when I hear, for example. Um, we're speaking about what the consumer consumer tastes. That's part of what we're trying to do here at CARICOM because we started to look very seriously at how do we uh, inculcate the behavioral sciences into policy making. Because, for example, our, one of our flagship programs, the 25 by 25 Agriculture Redu um, Initiative, reducing your, your food imports, by 25 percent by the year 2025 i would dare say um that yes that that's on track and all all being well we should be able to attain those those goals but if there is not a fundamental shift 
in the aggregate demand, in the actual taste, the demand and taste of, 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 of some of our demographics in terms of looking to using indigenous foods, albeit prepared in new ways, etc., etc. If we do not do that, then, frankly, initiatives such as 25 by 25 could run into a challenge over the, um, over the medium term. Because if the fundamental um, aggregate demand does not shift, then all that will happen is that whatever um, gains that we make can be compromised because people are, are looking for, are still gravitating towards the, the larger market. So for example, most of us people would, would appreciate this point. You ask somebody, any of your, your, your children, frankly speaking, what they can identify with, and I can tell you about all the international fast food brands that obtain in the United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But ask them about the local foods, and they probably look at you as, as if you are speaking Greek. So I, I just yield at this point here, but um, I, 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 I think your point. I, I think you can appreciate where I'm going with this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I certainly do, and to a certain extent, I sympathize with your. Um, unexpressed frustration because we have been speaking about these things for some time. Meanwhile, we continue to be heavily taxed economies. We continue to be highly indebted economies. We continue to be generally low gross economies. And it seems to me, and I would like to focus on that a little, um, well, watching the time a little later in the discussion as to how, how do we make structural changes in these economies, not temporary tinkering and short-term fixes, but how do we make structural changes in these economies to improve efficiency and productivity across the, across the economy? We have adopted a pattern um, of having high border taxes, for example, which is a, which is a tax on the entire economy. Um, at one time, and, and this could be verified, San Lucia used to have the highest cost per container for both exporting and importing. Um, and then we would complain that our manufacturing sector is not growing, is not robust, it's not resilient. But our costs are very high and our efficiencies are very low. Our productivity of labor it continues to be a major problem. Um, how are we transforming and, and, and repositioning these economies to perform better, to achieve higher growth rates? Not just for poor people to survive, but for poor people to prosper. I think these are some of the long-term trajectories that we need to be speaking about. Um, and while we address inflation as a temporary um, crisis, which has exacerbated because of the global circumstances in which the world finds itself, um, wars in the Middle East, et cetera, we still need, I think, to have that substantial discussion and that substantial strategy about what are we doing long-term to transform our economies and our societies into better places to do business and better places to live. Um, so that addresses both the consumer side and the production side. If your manufacturing sector is not, is not growing at the desired rate, there is a reason for it. It's not because manufacturers want to remain poor and inefficient. inefficient. So we have to have these discussions. And I'm very, very glad and quite proud to be part of this measure. Um, and as Minister said, having an unfettered discussion about what are the underlying issues here. Mr. Luizzi. I'm going to give you a first shot at that. And panelists, please, it doesn't always have to come back to me. Feel free to jump in with your, with, with your points. All um, right? Adrian, um, you touched on a pet peeve of mine. Good. Because this issue of you know, what do we want our country to be yes. in 25 years, not based on what is happening, where it will end up, mm -hmm. not projecting. It's uh, maybe forecasting, saying, I want our country to be that way. And what do I then need to do? Um, we had a wonderful opportunity, I think, um, after or during COVID, to look and say, where we are, clearly things are not working. That's not what we want. So let us reboot so we arrive at a different place. But we've reverted to some of the very same practices. Customs yeah. <laughs> are now inspecting more containers than they did during COVID. How does that impact? What did I mean, that, it's it, a nuisance, I'm sure, um, it, particularly if you're trying not to declare things. But 
if you are, but if you are running a bona fide business straight up and doing all your paperwork and all your procedures, how does this impact you? And remembering that our subject is inflation, and I'm not suggesting any nefarious um, practices here. I'm just saying that if you're running a bona fide um, business and government decides to increase or customs decide to increase inspection rates. How does this frustrate your objectives as a, as a business? Your goods are in the container, on the pot, and not on your shelves. Okay. Government is not collecting revenue because you have not paid the duty. It's still in the pot. You're not selling your good because it is still on the pot. You're paying taxes and you're paying cost every day. It stays there extra. And that cost, the consumer is paying it. Eventually. Eventually. Okay. So inefficiency then in, in, in yeah. at, at that point in the process should reduce it, it, Inefficiency across all agencies that interact with the private sector and the business community, if these efficiencies are improved and inefficiencies eliminated, the benefit goes to the consumer. Ultimately, we, we, we also, you know, I mean, just some of the comments to made, and um, I think sometimes we need to change it. Um, my good friend, Dr. Dr. Danny, Dr. Samuel, was talking about how prices have moved over over time. But that that, that that's a wrong it was a wrong impression because the price is what the consumer gets. How have costs changed? Did we see the cost of the goods that came came to Saint Lucia at the port increase over time? If the prices increase and the cost remains the same, no, you use the term price. And I think we have to be very clear. When you say the price is the price the consumer feels, we have to see what the costs are. If the costs are increasing, ultimately the price are increasing. We, we throw the phrase around price gouging. Two weeks ago, the President of the Chamber said very clearly, our members do not engage in price gouging. You may not like the price. You may not like the price, but they're not price gouging. People go to a, a, a store, and they don't like the price. I go to a lawyer, I don't like the cost, what he's charging me. Is he price gouging? I go to a doctor. Um, Mr. Moderator. Order, so, order, so, so, order. So, so I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying, you know, we need to use the right language to get the right, the right reason. We're talking about um, a simple example. Use pasta. And we said various reasons the cost of pasta has increased. And Danny gave the explanation. One of them that we sometimes don't think about. We have trade arrangements and agreements, Article 164, which says we need to support local manufacturers in a, in a narrow line of goods. With Article 164, there are costs to it. There was a 75% tax placed on pasta. It went up. Th 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 these are some of the things that happen. But we need to explain it so people could understand. And when it happens, you must tell them why we're doing it. We have a regional integration movement. We benefit from being together. And there are costs to it. We cannot only accept the benefits. We, we need to talk about that. Um, my, my good friend spoke about the cost of labor. I think, and Adrian spoke about you know, the, the productivity. We need to be pushing for a higher return to labor. Explain. Because, uh, you see, if I, if, if I have a job to move this, and the result of moving this will be money. If Jason charges me a dollar to move it, and I end up losing 50 cents because he's moved it, he's too expensive. If Adrian charges me $10, and when he moves it, I make $1,000 Adrian is cheap. The return to labor is great. So what we want to do is organize ourselves so that our processes, it's not just using technology, our processes are better. It infuses our workers with the capacity to make an impact. Too often, we have processes that are cumbersome, processes that don't make sense, processes that cause waste, spoil, Pilferage. Pilferage. Also, so, so we need to work on processes. And that, these processes are within businesses as well as within the public sector. 
And we, and we have to look at, 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 at that. Um, we talk about the 20, 25 by 25 program. That's a fantastic idea. Sometimes I'm not sure if the analytic work is rigorous enough. So St. Lucia has a huge import, food import bill. How much of that food import bill goes towards feeding the local population? Explain. So we have 180,000 people, but we're feeding a million tourists every year. So we have to bring in five times as much food. So if we start producing what we eat, are we producing what the tourists eat? So we may have to accept that we will have a huge import bill to satisfy the tourists. What we then need to look at is how can we reduce that first the element for the local, but also that element by introducing them to substitutes. But we should not knock the fact that we have that import bill just because it's high. We need to analyze it, and if we analyze it, we can then resolve and achieve the things we want to achieve. Um, okay, so your can I can I so chime point, in? Your point Mr. essentially Mr. is your point essentially is consistency of policy, broader approach, long-term objectives. Yes, indeed. Okay, right. um, take it. Mr. Moderator, since we have in an unfettered discussion, unfettered. That's what the minister asked for. <laughs> Please give her what she wants. As a consumer, I am opined that we do have price gouging, especially at the supermarkets. And we cannot pretend that it does not exist. Mr. Moderator, I am a shopper. I'm a consumer. You cannot get the same item at two supermarkets with one having double the price of the other. So, okay, did one get duty free on the importation of goods while the other had to pay duties? Because they go through, they are both chamber members. They both have the same issues as everybody else, whether it be customs, taking long with the process of unpacking, but the prices are different. And I, look, I, I, I go as far as looking at, what you call it, um, felt, spelt flour. One supermarket would have it 18.95, another one would have it 34.95. Isn't their price gorging? Not necessarily, I mean, all Same companies, brand. Yeah, but companies have different cost structures. I understand which is that. Brian was trying to explain as but well. But why would it be double? I cannot tell you. All right. Know. On another note, I would go to a supermarket and buy local watermelon. The same farmer who sells the watermelon sells it by the road. $30 for the watermelon. Every time you go to the supermarket, the watermelon has a $5 increase. Look, and I'm not speaking about imported watermelons, I'm speaking about local. There is price gouging, and we cannot hide from the fact that it happens. A phenomenal problem that we have in St. Lucia, and everybody sitting here who are either business owners, work for a business, or understand business, understands that our labor market is poor. And I believe it all stems from education. I am opined that the YE program, Youth Economy Agency, has done a great justice to ensuring that young people turn their talents and hobbies into a business. Why can't it start at the schools? It has to be inducted and incorporated in our education system because we have a universal education system. It means that everybody has to move through the ranks, go to secondary school. It's no longer what it used to be before. If you can make it, you'd go to a secondary school, and if not, you would probably go to the project. So everybody must move up. It doesn't matter what your educational capacity is, you go through the ranks. There will always be the technical students and the academic students. Those technical students are just left to the wolves. And they have to be between 15 and 35 now to benefit from the year program. Why can't such a program start from inception? I could remember going to Anglican school from stage one we had to bring all empty toothpaste boxes and cereal boxes, and we played shop. And they taught us exchange. They taught us merchandising from stage one. These things do not happen in school anymore, but yet still the business people would say, oh, the labor market, we, ha we do not have persons who can produce, etc." And we know that productivity affects profitability. 
So as we look at inflation, labor market is a, a force. It's, it's one of those indicators that will affect inflation and will affect businesses and the opportunity of, uh, uh, to, to have productive, to have profitability, and of course, to be able to afford to increase wages or salaries of their staff. If I do not make a profit as a business, where am I getting the bandwidth to increase wages? Even if you were to increase the, the, the minimum wage, how can I afford it if I do not have the right people to work to be able to bring that level of profitability? These are issues that we must bring to the table. Yes, we understand that the government is doing everything in their power to ensure that they can reduce taxes in certain areas that would cushion the blow of our economic growth and our business sustainability. But we still have the issue of how do we deal with the current labor market that we have. Children graduating from school, I interview children graduating from A level, from secondary schools, and some of them are no more educated than some form ones and twos. So we have to do something if we want to improve our labor market we have to start from the schools because pro productivity will always impact profitability and that will also lead to inflation. The government can give business people all the, all the incentives that they want to be able to order and get things profitable. But if you do not have the right persons to produce, as Jason rightly said, even in production as manufacturers, they feel it. But it's not only felt only in the manufacturing industry. I mean, I've seen Mrs. Skada say, she can tell you how often people pass through her doors. And as business people, we go through it all the time. You, Adrian, yeah, would be able to. Is, is a problem. Yes, that is. Definitely a problem. Okay, so you are linking producti productivity of labor versus the cost of labor into the production schedule right. of inputs and suggesting that if we had more productive workers, better trained workers coming out of the education system that our businesses would be more proficient, more efficient, and therefore could keep costs down. Yes. In a, in a nutshell. Yes, in okay. a nutshell and could help with the inflation. Anybody wants to no, just before you go chime there, in on that? Just before you go there, um, um, Tekla is perfectly with, um, right to have an opinion, um, but um, the initial Chamber of Commerce maintains that our members do not engage in price gouging. I have seen an example. I have seen an example where a product on a shelf was one price simply because it was bought locally and there was a distributor markup and a wholesale markup on it. That person subsequently imported the product themselves where they didn't have that markup and the price was almost half the price. Sometimes you have to ask questions. Sometimes they, they I, I have seen when I go to the market, the price of potatoes, what I used to buy for $5, is now $10. Local products are going up because the consumer, who are the farmers, are facing increased costs of production of everything. So sometimes we see things we don't understand, but we shouldn't jump to the first conclusion of price gouging, and the chamber rejects that. So let uh, could move on. Well, I would like to say, in, in fairness, that um, I have chair, seen can I, examples. Can I, I have seen examples where a distributor, for example, a wholesaler, would have passed on a price increase to a particular customer, and that price increase is reflected on the shelf today, and it has not, in fact, been passed on to another of their customers who, as a retailer, and so therefore you would see a difference. Even within, sometimes even within the same um, organization, you might see price differences. But it has to do as well with the price, with the cost structures. It has to do with pricing policy. It has to do with profit margins. Um, I cannot, um, I cannot rule on the matter. That's not my function here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and I'm not here to defend anybody, but I'm telling you, other but fundamental principles. At the end of the day, I think that that that, and I'm a business person as, as well, and I I don't know any business people who raise their prices without thinking about the impact it's going to have on their consumers and on their sales. So the business of raising prices. Well, you know business people who raise their price without thinking about the impact it's going to have on their sales? 
That's not a business plan. But there sale. is it for That's, increased profitability. Yeah, but if your sales are going to go down and, then you lose. and you're excluding certain customers, then that is, that is not a sustainable strategy. Not when you have a monopoly okay. on your goods. Well, I don't not think, when you have a monopoly. I think that's a simplified version, <laughs> to tell you the truth, but let's move along. Um, we are on the business of, we're, on, we're going to open the floor shortly because we don't have a lot of time left, only half an hour by my count. We're on the business of what can be done long term, structurally in these economies, to avoid the issue of being so susceptible, so vulnerable to imported inflation. Um, Mr. Cox. Yeah, well, um, what we can be doing um, in the short, in a, well, a short to medium term is one, we have to look at one, moving up the value chain. So in other words, to the extent we produce primary products, we also have to be starting to look at the processing of, the, of these products so we can go up the, the, the chain. One, two, um, I so fundamentally disagree with, with the um, previous speaker um, from the manufacturing sector because part of what we have to be looking at, for example, where you have um, your Tourists, for example, and I'm no expert on St. Lucia, so I don't pretend to be, but if you have your tourists, because it's a general point across the market, if you have your tourists coming in, part of the things that we have to be starting to do is basically reintroduce the countries to and the country's fare to the tourists. Obviously, changes in taste and so on occur over time, but we have to start. Too many times we travel all over this region. And what you see there, you really wonder if you're in North America or you're in, or you're in, the, in the Caribbean, right? And so when we look at that, and of course I, I have to, as, as, a, as a representative here from the Secretary, speak to and really, um, you know, correct any misapprehension that our 25 by 25 program does not have the uh, rigorous technical um, analysis that underpins the decisions that are being made are being put forward um, for the countries to, 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 to adopt. Because the honest truth of it is that when we are looking at the when we're looking at the production, the production capabilities, the possibilities for production integration, in fact we have gone as far as to have cross-border virtual um, agricultural extension services being offered. There's a level of the intervention that is being made. So what we have to do is we also have to take on board um, the use of the technology, not run away from it, not make excuses for it, but run away, from it, but to embrace the technology and, and optimize it for our usage. And the last thing that I want to say on this score is when it comes down to the customs, Part of the challenge that we face that too is a double-edged sword. Because in one respect, we do have unscrupulous people who abuse the, 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 the process. So for example, a case of, in, and I'm not speaking to St. Lucia, I'm speaking generally, a case of um, chicken back, what is supposed to be chicken backs and next coming into our country, right under the, 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 the first layer of chicken backs and next, suddenly occurred many bursts and flies. In other words, a mechanism to avoid the duty. We know these things happen, right? Um, so, um, and then of course, you have the drugs that you know that creates a problem, and it works both on import and export. Because, frankly speaking, when you have, for example, a hundred percent container ship um, stripping, right, and you are exporting, say you vacuum seal, say for example, you're sending out. I'm just going to use a random example, something like um, panty hose, for argument's sake. You vacuum seal the container. They break the seal to check to see if they are what is that is really what you are saying is in there is in there. But then sometimes the ports don't have the facilities to allow for the resealing of the container. So what started as a as a single container sometimes up to container and a half kind of sort. So the point I'm making is that there are arguments on both sides of the, the equation. Where because obviously your import costs um, and the costs at the port obviously will impact it. But at the same time, we have to, we cannot run away from the issue that you have people, unscrupulous people, take advantage of a situation. I've had situations, for example, here where I am in 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 Ghana, where all of a sudden, if if we, if, if, if we weren't judicious in what we were doing, all of a sudden a ticket from Ghana to the Bahamas suddenly went up to 5,000 US. 
So let us not pretend as if these things don't happen. They may not be as widespread as, as uh, one, some would like to believe, but the honest truth of it is that it does occur. Occur. And Chair, I do agree with you. Any business that tries to use that strategy as a longer term frame will not be in business for very long. But the sad truth of it is that you do have opportunists who use who utilize um the, the scenarios to, to extract as much as they can out of a situation. And indeed, it really does constitute vouching. I, I rest with that chair. I would like to Yes, I would like to speak briefly on this, um, not really from a manufacturer's perspective, but just from general, general, a general business perspective. There are times, of course, when you will see that, uh, that you have these price differentials like what you mentioned, you use the watermelon example. Uh, I did mention earlier that, well, in the case of manufacturers, for example, sometimes when we are hit with uh, significant increases on our input cost, we can't actually pass it on, at least not at the time. Uh, what tends to happen sometimes is we, we still need to pass it on eventually, uh, you know, for sustainability. Otherwise, eventually we will simply uh, be operating, uh, you know, in a lost position. So you will find situations where certain businesses, maybe they are hit with an increase, um, let's say uh, on a, something that they buy locally and, and resell, but then they can't, maybe at the time, they can't pass it on, at least not all of it, but later on they will pass it on. Um, so you will see a mismatch, you'll say, oh, but the price I pay for, every, uh, for, it, for that same item from the farmer, it didn't increase, and yet I'm seeing the sole market is increasing. So that's sometimes that's one explanation, a delay in passing on uh, an increasing cost. Another thing too is that the retailers generally have to, um, they, they, they have a kind of balancing act in terms of their overall margin. Uh, you will see that for, of course, the, there are a number of items they sell are price controlled, uh, and you know, or is otherwise essential, and they might not, maybe the margin they are earning on those is not enough, it doesn't meet their overall margin. They have to try to make that up on other goods that are maybe less essential. So they will, uh, you know, have a, a more attractive margin on those other goods. Uh, it doesn't, now I do not feel that that constitutes price gouging because uh, it's not particularly exploitative. It's only exploitative maybe if, if uh, as you say, if there is a true monopoly and then they are forcing people to buy something that, you know, like people don't have options. But I'm saying there is price control. The, the, the items that are considered essential, most of these, as far as I can tell, are subject to price control. So those items that you will see where there appears to be some kind of exploitation, I'm saying consumers have a choice. Uh, so uh, sometimes, you know, if there is not competition locally, then it's a matter of making a decision. Because, no, I'm saying consumers have more power sometimes than they realize. Uh, for example, if watermelon and the price of watermelon is too expensive and people collectively decide, you know what, we're not paying for that. Then uh, the suppliers, I mean, those selling it will have no choice but to, to lower the price or it'll stay there and spoil. Consumers yeah. have a choice, but I want us to be mindful that the things that are conducive to consumers' health are the most expensive, and sometimes these are what the retailers take advantage of. It is cheaper to eat unhealthy than to eat healthy. And they usually play price gouging with the things we need to eat healthy. A packet of conkles, the prices have not changed apart from one cent or two cents. Is that healthy for our kids? No. The soft drinks that we manufacture in St. Lucia, you have seen no significant That's increase. Price control, Maybe it? five cents. Soft drinks. And it, yeah. it's not price control. Maybe five cents or three cents. Have you seen it increase by $5 or $10? No. But those healthy foods that you need to consume, that's what they take advantage of because you must eat it. Yes, we have a problem with diabetes and hypertension. We've learned that that's one of our biggest ills in the country. So the doctors will guide you to eat what's right. You think the little Mali way, the, the low income owner can afford to eat healthy? Unethical business practices go on, and we must not turn a blind eye to it. A typical example of unethical business practices. Supermarkets will say they do not give bags because they protect the environment. <laughs> Environmental um, is very important to us now. We've changed it, climate change. They sell the same bags. Come on now. 
You all want an unfettered discussion? I'm giving it. <laughs> they sell it, and, and of course, one supermarket boasted about their seven million dollar profit just in bags. Okay. Yeah, I think it's Thank important. You. I think it's important not to oversimplify certain things. <laughs> um, there is a, and I, I really don't want to get into the arbitration of, of issues among panel members, but there is a certain cost to the to the environment of. Um, waste and waste management and degradation of the environment. I believe that the logic of charging for a plastic bag or other, any other plastic is dis to discourage people, not to say that um, it's not a religious practice. It is to say there is a cost to it and you will think about how many bags you use. Whereas previously, all of us would go to the supermarket and we would use as many bags as, as, they, as we are given. So now we just have to think about it. And certainly part of the process is changing our thinking about how we consume, which is a point that Tekla has made very, very eloquently. Ladies and gentlemen, it is <laughs> time to open the floor as directed by the program. So I would like an orderly show of hands. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. We have one, the first taker. And remember that our, that our subject is inflation. Let us try and be useful to ourselves and to the people listening to us on the, on the, uh, on the media and the web. OK, so we have our first uh, question. If you want to direct it to a specific member of the panel, please feel free to do so. And also just give us your name and maybe your sector or your profession or you. some identification for the record. Thank you. Madhya Cherry, St. Lucia Industrial and Small Business Association. Um, first, I want to thank the government of St. Lucia for such a timely and important exercise. Um, and thank you, Tekla, for sticking to that point. Um, a few important observations and points I wanted to ask in terms of the private sector. Um, you spoke about the opening up of potential markets from Mexico and Brazil. To what extent is the private, se is the private sector willing to, to really push for that to happen? Because very often there's an expectation that government is going to do things. But we know that we would require the shipping lines. We know that we would require, for example, Guyana is an excellent point of entry in and out of Brazil. What is being done? Because if we just are aware of it in the next five years, we are just are aware of it, then nothing can happen. But perhaps the private sector can get together and invest in a shipping line, invest in regional travel, because one of the biggest problems for the small business sector is trying to get goods just, just around the Caribbean area. If you have to get goods to send kids, it has to go to Miami first. So at what point is the private sector going to invest to make this happen? This is one point. Um, the other one, um, I really want to speak to, and members specifically requested that we do that, especially members in the business of canteens and restaurants, are really frustrated with what appears to be price gouging. Um, and just to give an example, to what extent, if you have a retailer with only two outlets, one in the north, one in the south, can sell the same item at, at $40 when the bigger ones that have the economies of scale are selling that item for $85. There are so many examples, and they actually went and compared the prices so that we could make that point and make it very emphatically. And if the point is not to frustrate the cons consumer, then what then is the point? There may be some other clandestine objective of what is going on, and it needs to be addressed. And we want the government to do something seriously about the price gouging. The other point um, we want to make is the importance of the transition to renewables. This must be accelerated. Um, members are making an effort to get into solar, although we are told that there are concessions on solar, but it should be across the board, because when you go and import the product, um, you are told that you have to go through the broker and you have to apply, and it is not applicable across the board. So we are asking for solar to be um, for there to be concessions across the board and for it to be easier to access whatever concessions are available because members are still finding that when they go to clear the goods, they have to pay still a lot more to get it in. Um, the other point I wanted to make is with regards to the importance of 
um, planting what we eat and eating more local food. This is a very critical and important point. And especially when we look at what is happening in the world today with Ukraine, and I mean, at what point are we going to recognize that we need to find every mechanism and way, and way forward to encourage young farmers, encourage young men to get into, farm, into farming. We have, since there's no agriculture association, we have several farmers into our association. And what they're saying is not a lot of young men are willing to get into that. How many young men are willing to go and work under an existing farmer? But the young men are willing, if they get the incentive for input, and there are several areas where the government land is available, if they get access to that government land, you would be surprised how many young men would go into farming as farmers, as entrepreneurs in their own right. So oh, we Flavia. want to en encourage the government to get into the farm. That was it. This was my Thank main you point. very much. Thank you very much. So considering um, the time, we want to maybe limit ourselves to one substantial point um, for those people asking subsequently. Panel, some responses, please, from Ms. Jerry. First point to raise, um, as far as um, exploring Latin America, um, at our AGM, we, we use the tagline um, that the members are shopping the world for you. So already, we have noted a number of members are already export, uh, buying stuff from Latin America. In particular, Mexico, the point was raised that um, a lot of refrigeration equipment and material that a company inherited was actually from Mexico. So there's that. And we are actively working with the Mexican embassy for us to chart our way forward. They have um, promised to work with us to do a business mission, either to San Lucia or to Mexico. So we're actively exploring that. And we are putting our members in touch with um, our contact at Apex, who's working through Guyana to, to look at some of the goods that they're already exporting. Um, I cannot explain price differentials. I'm not here to pick up and say, well, this person is doing that, that person is doing that. But we will certainly raise the, the matter with our members. But I re reiterate that there are times where we don't like the prices. And I always, I always tell my members, my wife knows the price of the things in the supermarket better than them. And they, she has complaints. But we certainly will um, look and see what is happening and ask members to explain some of these differentials. Um, I, I can't talk about the timing of investment shipping, but there is an ongoing regional group looking at shipping issues and looking at establishing a regional shipping line. So that discussion has started at the ECCB and is continuing. Um, Any other panel members want to weigh in quickly on the specific issues? Uh, just so quickly, about the, about the shipping uh, and you know, investment in a, maybe a regional line, uh, the reality is that once there is a good business opportunity, then business, businesses will actually be attracted to it. When you see that there isn't, as if no one is making the investment, it's usually that there are um, certain constraints or impediments. So I think maybe regionally, uh, the regional bodies can look to see what, uh, what needs to be done to make it more attractive. It, it might not necessarily be uh, you know, b businesses from the region that do it. You find those from outside that are eager to come in. Uh, once there's a good opportunity, then you can be sure that it will be taken up. So. It just means that we need to see what is hindering um, that uh, desire for investment. Okay, good point. Market-driven forces. They, they tend to be um, rational economic explanations for most things that happen in economies. And sometimes I think um, we neglect to look at all the, in, uh, the, the factors driving consumer behavior and driving um, investor behavior or even business behavior. Um, sometimes it's very easy to jump onto one conclusion. We've got to broaden the discussion beyond that, I think, to consider other other factors. Um, there is one point that um, Ms. Sherry made regarding um, encouraging farming, and that brings me back to the point that Mr. Cox made when he said 25 by 25. Um, we can put a lot of emphasis in growing lo locally. I heard Brian said earlier that what do we do with the million tourists who come? So it means that we must import. I was a tourist in Nairobi, and I didn't see anything that I knew. I had to eat the, the food that the Africans cook, the chapachi and all the different names. There was no potatoes, there was no baked beans, there was no, nothing that I could have related to in St. Lucia. Did I starve? No. I adopted to the culture and I ate what they grew and what they had at the high-end hotel. 
I had to ask the chef, can I get eggs? There were no eggs available. I had to eat what they had. So we can adopt that philosophy. And that particular hotel has a 99% occupancy all year round. So we can encourage, as Ms. Sherry said, farming, create opportunities for our young men and women who want to get into it. We have, I guess, several crown lands or areas that we can encourage that type of industry. And we can get to 25 by 25 if we really move to that direction as a country. I think that's a valid point, and I think it was Mr. Cox who raised earlier the business yes. of changing tastes and aspirations so that we have a better match between what we are producing and what we are um, sure. offering. Um, uh, I, sorry, I just want to jump in very quickly. Just to say that it's, uh, ultimately it's the hotels that decide uh, what they want to purchase, you know, like in terms of food and other produce. Where we, um, as manufacturers, what we've appealed for in the past is for government to perhaps um, tie uh, the, the incentives that the hotels ask for when they come to operate. These should be tied to uh, certain uh, requirements to, to, to buy local. Um, so if they are incentivized to do so, I think they, they will. I think that's a very useful point. In the, yep. in the incentive legislation of some CARICOM right. countries, you do have a correlation between local purchases, local expenditure vis-a-vis -vis imported expenditure by way of measuring what the sector is contributing. And that gets balanced by, by the incentives granted. So that's a very progressive approach. Um, changing behavior. Yes, we know that the, that the hotels, as all businesses, will decide what they are offering, but what is the destination offering, perhaps, as an experience, as an authentically St. Lucian experience, is something that um, government and other agencies have control of and, and can influence. Um, Mr. Cox, as we get down to the wire, do you want to weigh in? And I say that asking as well, does the floor have um, any other issues? So, Mr. Cox, a quick, um, a quick input from you, and then we will go back to the floor. No, no um, my, 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 my big central theme is basically this. We need to reintroduce our people to our indigenous foods. We want to treat with that. That's one level. Two, we also have to look at some of our legislative interventions that will be required. So, for example, where we have... Um, for example, the push on for, for um, transitioning to, to alternative sources of energy and, um, for example, electric vehicles, to look at legislation to see how we can treat it that in the face of the monopoly providers of electricity, monopoly generation as well as distribution of electricity. So what are some of the things we have to deal with to treat with these things that can help to reduce our effective or, um, overall costing? But is it is it that the challenge we face is insurmount insurmountable? Absolutely not. But the but fact, the fact of life, it will take some adaptation to new technologies, new strategies, and of course, good old hard work. Thank you very much. Yes, from the floor, if you would use the mic and introduce yourself. Mrs. Kadas. Yes, Mrs. Kadas. Good morning, Sylvia Kadas. I want to ask, we tend to think that goods coming out of Mexico and Brazil will not be of the same standard that when it comes from um, the States. I find, and that's my personal opinion, that carnation coming from South America does not taste like any carnation that I have tasted. If you taste the carnation coming from the big countries, as opposed to coming from South America, there is a difference. As in better or not better? Well, in my, my opinion, there's a, an aftertaste. There's this strong aftertaste. So what I'm asking is that while you go venturing to Brazil and Mexico, will the standards be the same as when they in, um, export to America? Right, I think that's yours. Well, um, I think we will not import things that don't meet standards that set out by our standards bureau yeah, but, who is but, the quali but the quality and, and the preference will be decided by the market so um, for instance we have had instances where companies have tried to introduce new brands and new products and they're not successful because 
consumer, even if they're not as costly as the favorite brands. So really, really the consumer. So what we want to do is to ensure we always have choice. You have variety available. You have different pricing points for the products. So that question, it will be determined by the consumer. When you go, but you're going to explore it. Yeah, but, but, but my point is, who is going to guard us before we get, it gets to us? Are there going to be standards? Ensure, are we going to ensure that it is our standard that even that we can drink, yeah. or even that we yeah. that but, but the, Bureau of standards, gets, the, the Bureau of Standards has standards in place that regulates what can come into St. Lucia, because anything you import, you must meet the Bureau of Standards standards. They, they have the standards. So, so, they, the, so, so, so we're the depending lights, on, the, on the... So the lights that are catching on fire were not inspected by the, the lights. Don't you always hear they, they are us talking about don't buy these lights because they not they, were they not inspected by the well I would Bureau hope that standards? the Bureau of Standards sets the standards and at the customs if it doesn't meet the standards it is not allowed in if people bring them in or they're not inspected they have these problems the Bureau of Standards issues a recall and puts out a statement so that we do we no longer have them available on the shelves okay we'll see Okay, um, so, so I just want to just one no, I'm not cutting just, you off. I'm not cutting you off. I'm, I'm just making the point that um, government authorities can regulate um, standards. They cannot regulate taste. Taste of quality. So I guess the, the meeting point between your point and, and Brian's re response is that um, in terms of quality, yes, in terms of consumer taste, we must allow the market to decide, which is a, which is a, fair, which is a fair interpretation. Yep. Um, on the question of, of electrical goods specifically, which propose, which pose a, a hazard to public safety, etc., I think that is squarely back with the Ministry of, of with the um, Standards, Bureau. Standards Bureau to ensure. And the question might be: Do we have legislation to enforce those standards post sale and after consumption, so that um, importers and uh, um, importers and suppliers, manufacturers of these goods are held responsible or liable for the... Yeah, the Consumer the, Protection the, Act speaks clearly to how you deal with... with yeah, Thank with you, Brian. And who will guard the guards? That that. Uh, who will guard the guards? Uh, well, so you, you, you have to guard the... You have to guard the... Yeah. <laughs> the um, my one of... Uh, and that's just an observation. We have thought about it, and I'm wearing the hat now of the Vice President of the Vickers Association. And one of the things, and I agree with Mr. King, that we have found and we have been discussing it and hope to meet with Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Tourism, that we, who um, actually um, gives the concessions. concessions? The government, but it, the concessions come from the People. country. And we have found that in our um, industry. industry that Hotels only take bread from us, basically. But bread keeps you afloat. But where the profit is, is in gizzards and cakes. Other baked goods. And we have thought that part government should insist, as part of the um, concession, that they take a percentage. Not They can work with us if they find that our standards do not meet their standards, that it should be that we, they work with us, work with the bakeries, so, and whatever, that we can produce for them. And so it can then cut the importation bill, because that is a vast, and not only that, grow businesses. And then businesses will be able to give livable wages. Excellent. Sure. So I think that will be the nature of and the subject of the next um, panel, which is going to be convened very shortly by the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Finance. Because <laughs> 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 clearly there is a need for this sort of open, enlightened discussion. Yes. Um, I think that we, we, we have raised before, and I would just like to touch on it again, the business of whether or not all the left hands and the right hands are working together. And that, that applies across the macroeconomy as well as within government as well. There are many times when business people are asked to do something um, by way of record keeping or availability of information or even application for concessions, which is diametrically, 
opposed to what another ministry is asking you to do. And very often, it does not make sense. And very often, you have revisions to existing practices, which are, in fact, retrograde. They're taking you into unnecessary um, expense and procedure. And it, it has a cost. It has a cost in efficiency. And it has a cost sometimes in real bottom line terms. Um, we're taking comments from the floor. If there's anybody, by a show of hands, we're actually past the 12.30 deadline. Um, if there's one more comment, we can take it. If not, then I would ask for very brief closing remarks from our panelists. Going once, going twice, and we are closed. Thank you very much, Brian. In reverse order, Mr. Cox. Yes. So, Brian, you have the last word. <laughs> I dare not let Tekla have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cox, over to you, sir, for closing remarks very briefly. Okay. The mic, maybe. Where's the mic? So, Tekla, would you go there? Okay, in closing remarks, I would like to remind consumers that we all have a choice. It's important that you compare prices for the best deals that you can get on goods and services taking into consideration that sometimes we do not even have a choice in paying for the cost that we want. But however, it's important to look for promotions, loyalty programs, um, consider buying in bulk. I would love to also oblige the Ministry of Commerce to increase the time frame of the barrel concessions. Probably that might cushion consumer ability to eat what they, they can afford, since it would be much cheaper than the price gouging. Um, we also want consumers to educate themselves. Education and awareness is very important. Stay informed about economic conditions and how they may impact your personal finances or your spending power. Um, understand the factors contributing to inflation, which is the main discussion here and its important effects or its potential effects on different aspects of the economy. When we do understand and we educate ourselves and we become more aware, it gives us the power of spending, the power of saving, and the power of making informed and right decisions. And of course, the Consumer Association is always open to memberships. With numbers, we have strength and we can become a better advocacy voice on ensuring that as consumers, we are not disadvantaged in any way. Thank you. Excellent summary. Thank you, Teto. Although you did slip in the price gouging again. Yes, yeah. You yeah. just yeah. couldn't yeah. help yourself. I did mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. King. OK, uh, well, um, thank you, everyone, for giving me this <coughs> opportunity to be here to uh, really speak on behalf of manufacturers. And well, you. I have explained at least some of the challenges, the many challenges that manufacturers have faced in terms of inflation and being able to, uh, to provide, uh, provide our goods at prices that would be acceptable to the public. Uh, we, there are certain things that we are either looking to do, uh, sometimes with the support of the government and sometimes collectively as a, as a you know, manufacturing group. But I can say this, uh, the, I had mentioned earlier that the higher production volume, uh, which really leads, uh, requires higher sales, uh, sales volume, uh, the lower our unit cost. Where the public can help, in fact, is by, uh, by buying, by supporting local, by buying more local items, you would actually uh, make it uh, enable local manufacturers to effectively have a lower unit cost. So, in fact, uh, because ultimately, as manufacturers, local manufacturers, we want to, uh, to really be in a position to provide a more affordable alternative to the imports. Uh, because we cannot control the, the price of these imports as they rise. What we can aim to do is to maybe to control the price of our locally produced goods so that you have a, an affordable alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Cox, can you hear us now? I like the way you feel that. We were given you an opportunity for closing. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. The, internet the internet has, has been, been internet, internet has, has not, not been my best, best friend, friend. <laughs> to the at all. Um, um, the, the, no, in, in terms, terms of, of, of what I would say in terms, terms of closing, what is that? What we, we need, need to do is that we need to um, look to new new opportunities. And when I'm saying that, I'm not.
We seem to have a little seepage. Go ahead, please. Now, what I'm talking about, we, we can't be looking at solutions like joint procurement, um, cross border procurement where applicable, looking at, as I said, looking at some legislative fixes, um, also looking at up, increasing um, the upskilling. Um, that is that obtains within our sectors to make sure that people are availing themselves of the newest technology, newest techniques, etc., etc., et to drive efficiencies within the market. But as I keep saying, we do, we are impacted by externalities. I mean, the, the extraordinary freight costs that was visited on this region. Um, there's, there's very, there's not a, 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 a whole lot we could have done. But, but now no going, going forward, forward we, can we can embrace, embrace concepts, concepts such as nearshoring, near not just necessarily looking to Mexico, but looking within our, our region for parts of the, some of the destinations. Of the destinations. And, also and also place a little more emphasis on reintroducing our local, local population and indeed our visitors to what, what is the local, local fear in terms of foodstuff. Food so I, I will rest, rest there, share um, with, um, with my thanks for, for inclusion in this panel. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, that leaves Brian. In conclusion, I just wish to thank the Ministry once again for um, hosting this forum. Um, as you know, the Chamber had long suggested that we need to strengthen public education and we need to um, open the discussion because resolving these challenges faced by our countries is not to zone in on a prescription solution. I think we need to open our eyes to all the facets and look at all the various areas we can tackle. Um, we certainly think that there is need to support um, the consumers. We think there's need for government to look critically at how you tackle the most vulnerable, maybe targeted safety net programs would be most useful. We think that the support and the, of the agricultural sector to expand local production is also a program that we need to follow through. And the chamber will certainly participate and support all efforts. Our members will continue to shop the world to meet the needs of our, of our clientele. And we think that as a critical partner, we should not forget the impact of policy on the business community because they too are facing escalating costs and prices across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You've been listening to a discussion and presentations on the issue of inflation, the vexing issue of inflation, which affects both producers and consumers across most economies. Um, by way of history, um, inflation really um, rocked the world first, well, in recent history um, in post-war Germany when hyperinflation um, demonstrated that this was an evil to be avoided at all costs. In fact, it shapes German macroeconomic policy to this day where they are probably the staunchest anti-inflationary um, policy drivers in the European Union to date. Um, we've had other examples of hyperinflation um, closer to home in Venezuela, for example. Um, Kenya has had issues as well. Um, and we do not want to have those, those um, sorts of economic um, results here. We want to have an economy in which prices and costs um, increase at a manageable, affordable rate. Um, just to reiterate the uh, presentation by um, the Ministry of Finance, a generally acceptable rate of inflation is considered to be around 2%. Some inflation is important because it, it helps to grow economies. It is part of the economic model of most economies that you have an inflation rate with a general increase in prices, which is also a general increase in assets, which is to say that your savings are growing, the value of your house is growing, the value of your land is growing, and yes, other costs are also going on a gentle, manageable trend. So inflation is something that's, that's it's not intended that it should be eliminated. It's intended that it should be managed healthy, healthily in an economy where um, it helps to grow rather than frustrate um, growth objectives. Um, I think this has been a valuable discussion. I think it is one that um, should continue, both in practice and in, and in subject matter. Um, we, we are too isolated in this country, and having um, 
conversations in silos, thinking that each of us is right, and each of us forms opinions based on our own perceptions and observations, and with sometimes without listening to the other parties in the discussion, in the conversation. We're all entitled to our perspectives, but they should be informed, they should be objective wherever possible. And this is what discussions like this help to foster. We don't need to agree, but we certainly need to converse. Um, it would have been nice to have had a little bit more time to talk about some of the fundamental things that we can do to reposition our economy, um, to be less vulnerable, and to be less dependent on um, imported goods and services, which is where, in this particular instance, a lot of our inflationary trends are coming from. Our inflation, uh, the current inflationary trend, as was explained, has been exacerbated by global circumstances, Ukraine, the Mideast, um, post-COVID supply chain uh, problems. But they have, they, have, they have sort of settled with us because our resilience to those price increases, our ability to counter those, um, those price increases which are coming from abroad has not been as strong as it should be. So if we had, for example, in the, in the Eastern Caribbean, a greater um, control of our monetary policy, governments would have more levers to, to, to change. But as it is, we do not have active monetary policy. So we've, we've almost forced to deal with inflation from a purely fiscal point of view, and there are limited tools in the hands of governments to do that. But there are some fundamental things that we have pointed to in this discussion, and I will just list, list them very briefly. Um, and preface that by, by reminding us that government is $1.8 billion annually, $1.6, $1.8 billion annually in this very um, small economy. That is a huge chunk of resources. And it is really important that the government see itself as a primary shaper as opposed to a primary taker of economic circumstances. That position, I believe, is one that is well worthy of discussion. How do we maximize the economic impact of the $1.8 billion that the government, and I use the word advisedly, takes out of the economy every year? How do we maximize, how do we optimize the impact of that money? Because it is coming, tax revenue comes from somebody else. It doesn't come from the government. It comes from somebody else. It comes from economic transactions in the economy. So if we're taking that money out of people's pockets, out of people's bottom line, what are we doing with it to shape the economy in, and, and move it in the direction that it is supposed to be moving, which should be one, I think, of growth and investment and employment rather than a survival sort of mode and a, and a temporary measure and a tinkering sort of mode. How do we reposition? How do we transform? I think this is the substantive discussion that needs to take place. And inflation needs to be seen as an impediment to a longer goal, to a long-term strategy of where we really, really want to be as a country. And therefore, when we address it, we will be looking at longer-term issues. And this brings me to my closing point. So we have issues like border taxes. Do they contribute to inflationary trends? If the cost of a container increases, as we saw on the chart, from 4,000 US dollars to 14,000 US dollars, um, a substantial amount of that impact is actually government revenue. And that needs to be put on the table. So government's revenue calculated on cost insurance and freight quadrupled in that, in that single component. Um, of a container cost going up. There's nothing to do with the value, the intrinsic value of the goods, goods in the container, but government revenue, which is part of that extraction of $1.8 billion, is driven for no other reason, for no domestic reason, than the fact that the cost of moving a container internationally has increased. Um, port charges we spoke about. We have a mono monopolistic arrangement um, at our port. And any inefficiency there translates into a taxation on every single one of us insofar as it increases the cost of goods coming into our country. Energy, um, our, our energy policy, our green policy, these are things that I think long term we need to be looking at. It has come up more than once. Um, what are we doing about that? Can we have a discussion about it? Again, how do we reposition and transform so that we can reduce the impact of external 
um, energy costs on our development, on our consumption patterns. The productivity of labor, probably the most ticklish issue, apart from price gouging, um, that we need to consider. Um, are we producing the kinds of people who are going to create the kinds of efficiency and productivity that we need in our economy? Again, to be more reliant, to be more self-sufficient, so that we're not importing inflation all the time from other economies. Um, what do we produce for a day's labor? What do we produce? Because a day's labor affects every single one of us, um, whether you're a carpenter, a mason, an economist, or a, a brain surgeon. What you can produce in 24 hours, vis-a-vis -vis what other countries are producing in 24 hours, has everything to do with what your cost structure is going to be and what your price on the shelf is going to be. And your international competitiveness affects everything. It affects your exports, your imports, and your growth. Um, efficiencies in the system, particularly in government, we mentioned that as well. This is an important review that needs to take place. Are we asking our producers to do things consistently? Um, record keeping, accountability, compliance, etc. Um, and moving up the value chain, which I think was mentioned by Mr. Cox. Um, if, we, if we don't move the conversation from survival and um, you know, getting by, if we don't move that conversation from poverty alleviation to wealth creation, we're going to be having this, this discussion over and over and over again. Are we positioning our economy for wealth, for prosperity? We've got to stop thinking of ourselves at the bottom of the food chain. We've got to move ourselves up market. Our tourism sector has done it quite successfully, with room to grow, of course. But we have, we have not gone into the mass tourism market, and we've managed to have a Caribbean product which is generally suited to what we have to offer, with room to grow, room for improvement. So what can we learn from our tourism sector that helps move other aspects of our economy up the food chain? So moving from primary production in agriculture, which we have been talking about for ages and ages and ages. Um, and yes, I'm that old, um, to remember where, what are we actually doing about it? And this comes back to the regional collaborations that we need to create in order to have the synergies across the region because we are small economies and we must combine to have effectiveness. Um, price sensitivity is one of the things that can be addressed um, by moving up the food chain so that our products are not so price sensitive and they can withstand fluctuations in the general price level. That means that we continue to be um, demanded, our product continues to be demanded irrespective of minor fluctuations in price levels globally. We've touched on fair competitive practice. Um, I think this is something that needs to be, needs to be further um, explored and uh, the business of um, um, rates of interest um, by financial institutions, very tangentially touched, but something that is also very, very important. Um, consider, for example, that if you have uh, high border taxes that make white goods, which was mentioned, fridges, stoves, appliances, fairly basic things now, makes them so expensive that you have to use consumer credit to buy them, then you're increasing the cost of that basic appliance, a fridge, a stove, a washing machine. These are not luxuries anymore. If, if government policy is increasing the price of those things to a point where they have to be financed, then the price to the consumer is going to be 30% more than it should be on an annual basis. And these are, these are some of the policies that we need to be looking at to see if we are driving our people upward or downward in terms of their wealth. And I think it is time to change the conversation from poverty alleviation, which tends to be a national mindset, to actually wealth and growth and prosperity. And on that, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to bring our discussion today to a close and to thank once again both ministries of finance and commerce for initiating this exchange, this dialogue. I wish we had more time. And um, to acknowledge the minister's presence for a minute, I thought she would not have been with us for the duration, but. She has reappeared, and it is wonderful that she's here with us to hear firsthand some of the concerns from both the floor and the panel. Thank you very much, and I trust there's lunch. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, yes. Well, I've closed the panel. I've, okay. I didn't close the entire session. So, so, so we can step out? <laughs> no. We've got to be rude. Yes. So um, a vote of thanks will now be given by Mrs. Wendy Frederick, Director of Consumer Affairs. Over to you. Oh, we have a mic here. Do you want this one? Pleasant good morning to all. Afternoon. Oh, yeah. afternoon. Oh, my goodness. Please allow me to adopt the protocol already established. I must say we had some interesting discussions. We almost had to out the fire. <laughs> um, and it's very interesting. And when you look at our mission, To facilitate together with the private sector the establishment of a dynamic business environment which anticipates changes in global circumstances while strengthening and enhancing the productive capacities and competitiveness of industry and commerce, encouraging good business practices and consumer interest. So, So we see where the Ministry of Commerce, where we have to balance business and consumer interests, right? So um, I want to say thank you to the Prime Minister, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre, and the Government of St. Lucia for providing the opportunity to have this discussion in such a forum and for continually ensuring consumer education and welfare. I would like to particularly thank our Minister, the Minister of Commerce, the Honorable Emma Hippolyte for her support as always. And as Thomas Jefferson, I believe, who said, the purpose of government is to enable the people of a nation to live in safety and happiness. Government exists for the interest of the governed and not the governors. I like this statement. Uh, to our permanent secretary, Mr. Sophia Alfie Henry, for leading the charge, directing and ensuring that everything was executed with excellence as usual. It is indeed a privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who worked hard and participated to make this timely and necessary initiative possible. This event could not have happened overnight for sure, and the wheels started moving weeks ago with much research and planning, and we have been fortunate to have had the support and collaboration of the dedicated staff of the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Commerce, Ms. Lafay and her team, who are well-versed in the area of expertise. I'd like to say thank you for a detailed and thorough presentation. To Dr. Samuel, thank you for the great insight, of course, on the micro perspective and providing a clearer understanding. I'm sure we're all more enlightened after these presentations. And to our in-house panelists, of course, Dr. Tekla Fitz-Lewis, Fitz -Lewis, Mr. Brian Louisi, and Mr. Jason King, and the Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Joseph Cox, attending virtually. I would like to thank you immensely for your invaluable contribution and informative discussions. Indeed, we have garnered much from their expertise. Right? We agree to that? Let's put our together. Thank you to our moderator, Dr. Adrian Oje, for your guidance and, of course, doing it with your usual charisma. <laughs> I would like to, of course, thank the staff of the Ministry of Commerce for organizing, coordinating, and aiding in publicizing this event. I would like to particularly thank the staff of the Consumer Affairs Department for their usual support. 
I don't believe the word or words have been formed that will allow me to attribute them the praise that is due to them as it relates to their participation and willingness to always complete tasks beyond their comfort zones. And thanks to the media, of course, and technicians for the live broadcast and all your assistance. I would like to specially thank Mr. Glenn Simon in the back, the communication specialist attached to the National Productivity Council, NCPC, for unselfishly lending his expertise. And his, of course, that was done on short notice. And I want to thank his director, Mrs. Lisa Montoot, for loaning him to us. Let's put our hands together for Glenn. <laughs> to all participants, the general public, both in-house. Oh, yes, I did. The Ministry of Commerce, Janine. Of course, Janine, thank you, our information officer, <laughs> for working so hard. Yes, and putting all of this together. Thank you. And of course, to all our participants, um, the public, both in-house and virtually, thank you for joining us and for your general contributions. Thank you all here for being with us today. And I pray that you have a wonderful day ahead. And I would like to say a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Oh, and we have refreshments. <laughs> we know it's lunchtime, it's 104. But we have refreshments in the back, so let's indulge and enjoy. <laughs>